I'm Dr. Melanie Brickman Borchard, and I'm Director of Life Sciences here at the New York Academy of Sciences. I have a little bit of a cold, so if my voice goes in and out, my apologies. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all today for the event, What Happens When We Die? Resuscitation, Insights from Resuscitation Science. I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to our live stream audience who are participating remotely. This meeting is jointly presented with the Critical Care and Resuscitation Research Program at NYU Langone Health. We have a fantastic agenda ahead of us today. And for that, I would like to sincerely thank our partner at NYU for all this hard work in planning the event and the agenda. Dr. Sam Parnia, Director of NYU Langone's Critical Care and Resuscitation Research Program. I'd also like to thank all of our speakers for agreeing to share their work with us today. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Academy, we are one of the oldest nonprofit membership organizations in the United States. In the past 100 years, we've grown from a community of physicians and naturalists who met in downtown Manhattan to a global organization with over 20,000 members in 100 countries. In that time, the Academy has brought together communities from multiple sectors at conferences and events like the one today to address the most pressing global challenges. For those of you who aren't already Academy members, accessing cutting-edge scientific research and broadening your professional membership skills by becoming a member of the world's foremost cross-disciplinary scientific organization. Professional members enjoy many benefits, including free or discounted access to over 100 scientific events each year held here in New York, across the United States, and around the world. Now before we begin today's event, I want to give you just a little bit of information about some upcoming Academy events that may be of interest to you. First, we have a meeting on December 3rd on enabling technology and data drug repositioning. This symposium will unite scientists from academia, industry, and government to discuss best practices for rational drug repositioning by highlighting computational methods and big data mining, open collaboration, and initiatives for rare and neglected diseases. The next event is on December 4th. We have an evening program titled Beyond Oneself, The Ethics and Psychology of Awe, that will explore how awe shapes our perspective and views on everything from science to morality. Please join us for this exciting discussion moderated by a Peabody award-winning journalist, Steve Paulson, from the program to the best of our knowledge. For more information on other meetings, you can feel free to take flyers from the back of the room here on the rack or in the lobby on the wall. And for those of you who are looking to access the agenda, the Academy is proud to offer a mobile app to all of our attendees. Download the, download the app today to access this and other information about the conference, as well as the networking opportunities. For questions on how to download the app, if you don't already have the program in your phones, you can please see one of our staff members who are at the front desk. Now to stay connected during today, Free wireless access is available in the conference room. There are little slips at the front desk that have a password. <coughs> um, the username and password are also on the slide if you can read it. Um, and if you're posting about this event on social media, please tag us at at night sciences and use the hashtag resuscitation2019 to join the conversation. And your feedback is important to us. In about a week, we'll be sending you a link to a quick online survey that will give us information and your thoughts about today's program. So finally, I have just a couple of brief housekeeping announcements. I'd like to request that everyone take a moment to silence their cell phones. I'd also ask that you please refrain from making any audio or video recordings <coughs> or taking photographs during the presentations. Please also refrain from taking photographs of posters um, without the posters, so that's um, some of the speakers uh, today may be discussing unpublished data, so that's the reason for this. I also request that members of the press who are in attendance be sensitive to this issue and follow up with presenters if you wish to report on any of the materials that they are discussing. I hope that everyone enjoys today's stimulating presentations and discussion. <coughs> now it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Sam Parnia of the NYU School of Medicine. Dr. Parnia is Director of Critical Care and Resuscitation Research Associate Professor of Medicine and Co-Director of the Resuscitation Committee at NYU. Welcome, Dr. Gordia. Thank you very much. 
very much, Melanie. Um, you're very kind uh, with your introduction, and I have to really thank you very much, particularly for your help in enabling us to put this program together. And I also am really grateful to all the speakers who are here today uh, to share their insights with us. I have to start, I, I prepared, I don't normally read anything, but I have prepared uh, something that I want to go through as a background. But I have to just ask a question. We must be a pretty morbid bunch if we showed up to talk about an event that's describing death. And I think, I hope we're not, but I think it's important to realize that there's been a really major shift in our understanding, and that is what this, uh, this symposium is all about. So um, I want to really just sort of address that before we start, and then the, the logic of the presenters and the subjects will all make perfect sense. Throughout history, human beings have always been fascinated with the question of what happens when we die. Death is a universal human experience, yet remains one of life's greatest mysteries. Traditionally viewed as an absolute and irreversible endpoint, recent scientific studies have shown that contrary to our historical and social perceptions, death itself is a biological process that is potentially amenable to medical interventions, even after it has taken place. In particular, Recent studies have overturned conventional medical teaching over the past 50 years. For decades, physicians and neuroscientists have been taught that brain cells die after about five or 10 minutes of oxygen deprivation. As a result, doctors often assume that providing medical treatments to people whose hearts have stopped beyond a certain point in time will be futile. And as a result of this type of thinking, they stop all active treatments. And of course, inevitably, this culminates in death. But what if some of those people could be brought back again? Today, scientists are discovering that brain cells are actually much more resilient to the effects of oxygen deprivation after the heart stops and a person dies than had ever been understood. This discovery has led to a major scientific paradigm shift, which is much more than just theoretical implications. From a practical perspective, this discovery is critical, as it will undoubtedly open up tremendous opportunities for new treatments in the coming decades that will potentially save our lives and our brains. And I purposely say our brains and our lives because the reality is that we will all suffer a cardiac arrest sooner or later. Unlike common diseases in medicine, whether you think of it as a stroke, heart attack, infections, any type of cancer that gets all the attention. Actually, this is the only medical condition that is universal, and it's the only medical condition that will affect every single human being on Earth. And so, unfortunately, it's sad that it's one of the areas that's most neglected, in my opinion, in terms of medical research, and particularly with funding. Although many people think cardiac arrest is synonymous with a heart attack, it is not. Biologically speaking, cardiac arrest, which literally means the heart, the cessation of the heartbeat, is synonymous with death by cardiopulmonary criteria. And medically speaking, doctors refer to this as cardiac arrest when they're attempting to resuscitate and restart the heart after it stopped. Now, for people who have requested not to be resuscitated, who asked to not have CPR, then for those people, they will call them dead and declare them dead at that time. Equally, in cases where doctors have attempted and feel that it's not successful, they will then call the person dead. Many people will recognize that cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR, <coughs> remains the mainstay of treatment for cardiac arrest. And while it was revolutionary when it was first discovered in 1960, CPR today is a treatment that has a lot of medical limitations. We urgently need new treatments, because without the discovery of these treatments, we will all be vulnerable to potentially either developing brain damage or not coming back to life when our hearts stop. During the symposium today, we will discuss recent findings that have upended conventional notions about the nature of brain injury and death. These include a recent study from Yale that was published in Nature, in which brain function was restored in post-mortem hip brains four or more hours after death. We will also explore the innovative and pioneering method of emergency preservation and resuscitation, a novel approach to the management of ex exsanguination in people who suffer cardiac arrest that utilizes hypothermia, 
cooling people down, saving the organs, saving the brain, um, in order to buy time and enable uh, surgeons and other physicians to try to fix the underlying condition that had caused the person to, to have a cardiac arrest. We will also discuss the awareness during resuscitation, two study which is exploring what happens to human mind and consciousness at the time of cardiac arrest and clinical death. This study has already recruited 400 subjects and is currently the largest of its type, uh, being carried out across 20 hospitals in America and, and in Europe. We'll also just briefly mention complementary studies that also look at this area of research as well. Now, just before I end, I mentioned earlier that CPR as a treatment has severe medical limitations. I don't want you to misunderstand. I think it's fantastic. And interestingly, and in spite of this, today we have many millions of people who've been brought back to life simply because of CPR. And many of those people have consistently reported unusual transformative experiences from the period in which they had crossed beyond the traditional threshold of death. These experiences include a review of one's life, but this is not simply a your life flashing past you. It's a purposeful review of all their interactions with other people. They judge themselves based upon their humanity, they review everything they've done, and they incredibly experience things from other people's perspective when they have gone beyond that threshold of death. So perhaps we were never meant to have been able to go beyond this threshold of death, to even teach along the cost of death, scientifically speaking. But now that this is a reality, what are we to make of these reports? And in our ever-growing, pleasure-driven, and self-centered society to some extent, does our humanity truly matter? Does it matter that when we die, we might review our humanity and look back at our lives differently to the way we thought about it before? And to me, were some of the ancient thinkers correct about their significance that was laid on to humanity and their interpretations of what happens when we die? So, although death is a reality for us all, I'm sorry if anyone's come here to think that we're going to be able to tell you that you won't die, that is not true. It will be a reality for all of us. But interestingly, as the actor Alan Alda has recently been quoted as saying, it's amazing that most of us live as if we're not going to die. So what I hope is that in this symposium and through this symposium, we'll be able to help us all better understand what happens when we die from a scientific perspective while also exploring the human side of surviving a near-death event, and that will hopefully enable us all to get a deeper recognition of this emerging reality of us all. So with this, I would like to, uh, Melanie went through the program for the day, and she illustrated it. I'm going to uh, call on our first speaker, Dr. Lance Becker, who's sitting over there, who's really a pioneer in resuscitation research known him for many years, and I'm indebted for everything that he's done and that we've learned from him. He's the chairman of the emergency department at Northwell Health, um, and he has particularly focused on research for more than 25 years, and he's illustrated the mechanisms by which cells become damaged uh, after the heart stops, but particularly when the heart is restarted through uh, the restoration of oxygen to the brain and other tissues. So with that, I'd like to ask Lance to come and join us. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Lance Becker, and uh, haven't had the privilege of getting to know most of you. Uh, and very quickly, I want to find out who you are. You know, um, can I just do a quick, quick poll? You can use a. We don't have a digital device, but we still have analog <laughs> devices here. Um, just a show of hands. Do we have students here? Are there students? Terrific. And do we have some doctors here? Do we have doctors? Oh, there's a lot of doctors here. Any nurses in the audience? What about just general people that are interested in this? That's terrific. Do we have anybody that's, people that have had a near-death experience? I know we do. Terrific. All right, so we have a really diverse group here. And uh, what I'm gonna do is very quickly try to bring everybody kind of up to speed on what this field of science looks like, starting with pretty basic stuff and moving up so that the rest of the speakers will uh, be able to put their comments in that context. And so first, my disclosures, and three, I now use this as to go into my most important disclosure. You can see that 
you know, I spent, just for those of you who don't know me, I spent 17 years at the University of Chicago, 10 years at the University of Pennsylvania, and for the last four years I've been at Northwell Health as the chairman of emergency medicine there. And of course, part of my job is to get grants, and I do that, and you'll see those up there. Um, but what I figured out is I have a much more important conflict of interest, which is that I have an intellectual bias. And I'm going to be very frank about that, okay? Because an intellectual bias is much stronger than any other type of bias that I've seen in, in the field of science. And that is, that as Sam alluded to, right now we typically will pronounce people dead after they've experienced a relatively short period of being without oxygen. And it is my bias that there is much more we can do to dramatically expand that survival window. So I will own that bias, I will try to defend it, and you can feel free to challenge me about it. Now, this was a Newsweek piece that was done, and the reason that it did highlight some of the work that we do and some of the work being done by laboratories around the country, and here you can see the title, This Man Was Dead, He Isn't Anymore. And I use that because I really think that's the fundamental essence of resuscitation science, and that's what we're going to be talking about here. And in terms of how I came to this and the way the field has progressed, one of the things that we've been talking about is sometimes it's hard to know when a person is actually dead. So just a little bit of background on that, that of course we've got this thing in our chest that beats and is our heart and drives all of our blood flow. And the, when I came to the field of cardiac arrest, it was essentially all about getting the heart restarted. So the idea was that if as a doctor, I got the patient's heart restarted, I had been successful. But what we've learned in the last 20 years is it's, there, there, there's another organ that we really need to begin to focus on, which is the brain. And so I want to submit to all of you that there's been this transition, and you can see this transition in actually the legal definitions of death, that there was a legal definition of death, that when the heart stopped, the person was dead. And we know that's obviously not true. We now believe that when the brain irreversibly stops, a person is dead. And what we find ourselves in right now in the year 2019 is a sort of uncomfortable space where there's kind of this zone in between, the gray zone, where we're just not quite sure. And what I want to submit is that that zone is much bigger than we think, and that the opportunities to resuscitate people are much larger than we also think. So I want to move right into sort of the model, the way I think about resuscitation, which is you've got basic CPR. And a quick question, how many people in the audience have done CPR on a person? a lot of people who have done it on a person. Well, good. I feel much safer. And I do feel that everyone ought to be able to do this. And uh, I wouldn't want you to leave without that, without at least that being highlighted. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the critical elements, chest compression, defibrillation, airway. I'm then going to move really quickly to what I call advanced resuscitation. These are things that you, you might not get in every <coughs> medical situation. And there are things like cooling, advanced monitoring, ECMO and cardiopulmonary bypass, which I'll talk a little bit more about, beginning to deal with reperfusion and post-resuscitation injury, which are the things that happen as, as the physiology goes on after cardiac arrest. And finally, I want to take us to the future of just a little bit, at least the future that I see, where we'll be dealing much more with brain resuscitation, specific cocktails, and sort of taking on this issue of what is irreversible death? What is the point of no return? So very quickly, I want to turn now to basic CPR for just a moment. And uh, many of you have done this. This is sort of the hallmark. If there's one thing to take away from anything I'm going to say, it's that if you have an opportunity to do this for a person who's pulseless, this is the very best thing you can do to save that person's life. And that this has saved literally tens of thousands of people. You put your two hands in the middle of the chest and you push hard and you push fast. All right? And 
we should actually all know how to do it and we should teach everyone how to do this. Now, of course, another thing that's quite important is airway and breathing and getting oxygen into a person. And we know that there are techniques for this and uh, many of you have been taught those techniques and they likewise are a very important part of our basic CPR. And finally, when the heart is in a specific type of rhythm from a cardiac arrest that we call ventricular fibrillation, there's a technique of providing electricity to the heart, of shocking the heart, that can essentially restart that heart called defibrillation. And there are now automatic external defibrillators that are available. Um, they're in all the airports. I had the privilege of being involved in one of the first studies where we place those automatic defibrillators in O'Hare Airport, Midway Airport. And over the course of that year, it saved 11 people's lives where previously there had been a survival rate of zero within those airports. And so that is why there are now defibrillators in buildings like this and in airports. And another very important part of basic CPR. Now, I would be remiss if I don't highlight that these basics are really the fastest way for us to save people's lives around our communities right now. That as we think about, if you say, what can we do right now to save more lives in New York or in any other community? It's get these basic things out to more people. And I think we all have an obligation to work on that. But I also want to talk about some newer concepts that are coming along, about teamwork and the idea of some metrics. So here you can see this, hospital uses Formula One tactics to help newborn babies. Well, what are they doing? What we figured out is it's actually doggone hard to do a resuscitation. It's really very challenging. I want to say more about that. And you cannot fix what you do not measure. This is one of the things that I believe as someone who now works in organizations that are trying to be better and better and better, you've got to measure it. So a little bit about that. This is a uh, monitor defibrillator, and this little hockey puck right here is actually a device that sits on the chest, and as you do CPR, it can measure each compression that the person is getting. So now we have this compression monitor, and you can actually see those little things going up and down there. That's each beat, and you can see when it goes to a flat line, it's because no compressions are taking place. So we now have the ability to monitor our performance. It's very important. But very few cardiac arrests today currently get any type of monitoring. 99% cardiac arrests are simply unmonitored. And I think that's a mistake. Now what else could we do? And has anybody seen one of these? They're all over. Look at them. All over. They're in our emergency department. So I want to tell you just a little bit about our video initiative and Dr. Lee is in the back and he's been very involved with that along with some of the other members of our team. And what we're now doing is actually videotaping our actual cardiac arrest. These are not simulations. We have over 260 of these that we videotape. And when the cardiac arrest starts, we turn the camera on, we run it, and we review them on Thursday morning as a big team. And here you can see Dan Ralston with a video and we're going through what happened and everybody joins in in that and so what we've developed is like a learning curriculum where we we look at how we do we find areas for improvement we try to improve and then we continue to monitor and I just want to show you uh, some data that was presented yesterday at the American Heart Association these are the results of this program so far and what you can see is that our rate of return of spontaneous circulation, that's this ROSC thing, has gone up from 26 to 41 percent. But most satisfying to me is our, our rate of survival leaving the hospital has gone from 3 percent to 7 percent with patients that are coming in over this period of time while we've been working on this. So I just say that to highlight how much better we could do in this country even with the basics. So now to advanced resuscitation. And um, I want to focus on four areas. One is on cooling, one is on performance and monitoring, on the use of ECMO, and on reperfusion injury and moving into 
the things that are going to be further advanced in terms of the therapies that are coming down the line. So cooling. How many of you have just heard of cooling? You know, that you can cool people down. Good. Many people are familiar with it. So what we know is that currently it's a great benefit to cool a person down after a cardiac arrest, particularly if they have any evidence of neurologic dysfunction. And we target it's very mild cooling to about 33 to 36 degrees for about 24 hours. Now you can tell there's a lot we don't know. The one thing that I think everyone agrees with is as part of it we want to avoid letting that person develop a fever to become hyperthermic. It's very bad for the brain. And so it just it looks kind of like this. This is like an external wrap that goes on the patient and it has ice water that goes through it, it cools their temperature down, and then it controls that so that they don't overcool. There are other ways you can cool too, with IV saline, with catheters, there's a whole series of ways. And it's being very, it, you should know there's a very active area of investigation in this country right now. And I believe we even have uh, representatives from some companies that are thinking of innovative ways that they can cool. This was a study that, again, just was presented in the last month from France, where they showed, again, the power of cooling in being able to protect individuals after a cardiac arrest. And it mostly seems to protect the brain. Now, what do we do about monitoring how we do? And you're, you, you've sort of already heard a little bit of my bias, that I believe that if we don't monitor, we don't always do the best job. And so, um, what else could we monitor, though? Because maybe we could go beyond this. If you think about this, this is sort of a hockey puck on the chest of a patient. Well, is that the best monitor, really? Well, there was a lot of data that was presented at the American Heart Association that you could, you could start to move to see if those chest compressions are moving the blood around. So you could measure something like blood pressure. Well, we could go further. Remember, we want that blood to go around, and we want it to go up to the brain. So we could measure oxygen in the brain with a technique that Sam has thought a great deal about. And um, it's called NEARS, or Near Infrared Spectroscopy. It's a way that we can actually see if what we're doing to the patient is getting the job done and getting the oxygen up to the brain. And of course, I think we may be able to eventually even go further. These are mitochondria. And no talk of mine is complete without mitochondria, so I just want to say I had to do that to complete my talk. Um, but those are sort of the power engine inside the cell, if you will. That's where, the, that's where all the oxygen that you breathe in is going to, okay? And so we could have a mitochondrial meter, and indeed we're working in our laboratory on how we might be able to do that, because we could learn other things about how the cell is behaving. And I'm very agnostic. I don't really... I think all of these monitors may be very, very useful. And monitoring represents a major opportunity to improve our resuscitation, particularly if we take the viewpoint that we're going to use the monitor in the following way. We've got this monitor, say, of the brain. And let's say it's not so good. Then what we should do is change the way we do CPR. Now, what I just said there is quite radical. And the reason I say that is right now the way CPR is taught is it is taught as a one-size-fits-all therapy. So when all of you took your course, you got a mannequin, you compressed it one way, a certain rate, a certain depth, and it turns out there's other things that we could do to optimize that. But we can't do that without a monitor, and if we want to get into the area of customizing our resuscitation for each patient, does a big patient need the same rate as a small patient, or a man, or a woman, or an older person, or a younger person? We need to be able to customize our resuscitation, and this monitors have the ability to do that. Now, a few words about this very new technology called cardiopulmonary bypass. Sometimes it's called ECMO, or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Essentially, a heart-lung machine. They're in almost every hospital around the world. And what we're now doing is bringing those to the bedside of a patient in cardiac arrest and rapidly putting them on this kind of support. And we are doing that at Northwell, 
I should have warned people. I hope nobody has a weak stomach on this, because this is actually Demetrius Yiannopoulos in Minnesota. That's Demetrius sort of standing over there. And all that red stuff there is, that's, that's not like for your benefit, OK? That's what I'm trying to say. That's like, so I just want everybody to know. It's like, it's a major thing. You don't do this with uh, kind of just two hands and no equipment. You can see all the equipment that surrounds Demetrius there. But this is the best way to get reperfusion, certainly to the brain. We have to be honest, it's technically difficult. It's hard to do. It's invasive, it requires a big team. You can't, this is not a one person job. It can't be done with one person. Right now we only do it in very, very selective patients and obviously it's resource intensive, it costs money. But there's no question that this is moving out into the world. So this is another picture of ECMO being performed. Does anyone recognize the venue? Somebody knows back there. Say it loud, Tom. It's the Louvre. It's the Louvre. So this is the Samu in Paris, and they have a team that places patients on emergency cardiopulmonary bypass. And they are cannulating a patient in the Louvre, right there. We know this is growing. It's growing worldwide. There's no question it's accelerating, and it's accelerating everywhere. We've got a lot to learn about it. But I'm going to say this. It is still technologically very primitive. Very, very primitive. Like, we're still using kind of these big machines, and we've got to make that better. But it does offer the opportunity that it very, very significantly enhances survival in a way that CPR will frequently fail. And by that I mean survival rates that go to 20 and 30 and 40 percent. So now I want to begin to sort of wrap up here with the reperfusion injury. And I just I got this yesterday out of Wikipedia. So you know, reperfusion injury, sometimes called ischemia reperfusion or reoxygenation injury, is the tissue damage caused when blood supply returns to tissue after a period of ischemia or lack of oxygen. And um, I had the pleasure of sort of really writing a lot and doing a lot in the laboratory. We defined this in cells and mechanisms for it. We're not going to go into that. It clearly happens in cells, not controversial. It also clearly happens in the heart, not controversial. A little more controversial, but I think the evidence is very good. It happens in the brain. And so as we talk about what the limits are going to be to recover a brain, this is my image of the brain on fire, okay, that very much reperfusion injury is indeed the brain on fire. And I'll tell you why I say that. So here's how this works. And this is not obvious to everyone. So this is a patient's brain. And now something bad happens. And you take away the oxygen. And it could be a cardiac arrest. It could be that they bled out. It could be all kinds of things that they now no longer have oxygen in their brain. And after a few minutes, in fact, if we could see that brain, it looks a little funny. Okay? There are things going on and signals going off in that brain, and there are messages going off in that brain that are quite abnormal. So now they come to my emergency department. What do I do? So at this point, I know what I do, and you all know. You've watched ER you know exactly what's going to be done. I'm going to give them back oxygen. And not only am I going to give them back oxygen, I'm going to give them, like, not a little bit of oxygen. I'm going to give them a lot of oxygen, right? And so what I'm hoping for is I get this result that now that brain goes back to normal. But reperfusion injury occurs when, as opposed to that brain going back to normal, we now get a new reaction that begins to take place after the introduction of that oxygen. And that brain begins to literally go on fire. Now, the reason that I say on fire is because if we, fire is an oxidation event. Okay? And to a large degree, we believe that reperfusion is driven by an oxidation event as well. So, we know that mitochondria plays a major role in this. And I want to highlight that for a short period of being without oxygen, you don't have to worry about this. It's not an issue. 
But as the period becomes longer and longer, it becomes an issue. But I want to tell you that all the evidence is, is that this is treatable, that it can be treated. There is no reason to believe that it is irreversible. So we want to rapidly reperfuse, but without a lot of reperfusion injury. So what can we do? Well, we know cooling works for this. And this is cooling is one of the things that essentially proved that reperfusion injury exists in the brain. Because when you cool some of them down after they've had a cardiac arrest, we know they're actually better. And one of the things that we're now beginning to try to develop is what we call a reperfusion cocktail sort of a number of agents that we mix together in an attempt to control the reactions that drive this reperfusion injury. So finally, I want to wrap up with brain resuscitation and these cocktails. So right now, the cocktail that we're developing, and I think that you're going to hear from the Yale group about a cocktail that they've talked about. And uh, at the Heart Association, there was another group that's looking at a cocktail, is one that's designed to hit a number of metabolic pathways. And so they have to fix the ionic disequilibrium of the cells. The cells that normally have sodium in one compartment and potassium in another compartment, everything's all switched around, and that has to be fixed. We know that we need antioxidants to take care of that oxidation event that I was talking about. And we need mitochondrial medicines that are targeted to get into the mitochondria so the mitochondria doesn't keep doing a lot of bad mischief to the cell. And finally, we also need to protect the cell membrane. We need critical cofactors. And we are now attempting to put these agents together. And if we're very lucky, what we are going to do is put them in with the cardiopulmonary bypass machine. They get mixed together where because that machine is pumping five liters a minute through the body, it can rapidly gain access to the brain, go to the, into the capillaries of the brain, and become active and protect the cells of the brain during resuscitation. And so this is the system that we are very actively working on in the laboratory. And some of the members who are working on it are sitting in the back. And um, I hope to be able to talk more about this in the future. So I just want to wrap up by saying that we've made huge advances in resuscitation. I've tried to give you like a snapshot of basic CPR, advanced resuscitation and future, and a little bit about some of the controversies. We know that cooling and a cocktail and a pump are going to be very integral to the future of resuscitation. But I just want to leave you that I believe this death window, if you will, is rapidly opening up. And, um, and I look forward to hearing the other speakers. Uh, and I think this is a time where we should be very, very optimistic about what the next decade is going to bring us. Thank you very much. I want to thank Lance really for doing such an amazing job of describing the whole history and then the present and also the future. Um, one of the key battlegrounds, I think the key discovery here is that actually um, there is room for us to try to save the brain in people who have cardiac arrest. And that's a big fear that everyone has, that we have people like Terry Schiavo who end up with persistent brain disorders or even a vegetative state. I've asked one of my colleagues, Dr. Ariane Lewis, uh, who is the director of the Neurological uh, Critical Care Unit at NYU Langone, to come and give a talk about measures that we can put into place to save the brain after it's been critically injured after cardiac arrest. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. All right, so building on Dr. Becker's talk, I'd like to talk to you guys today about cerebral hypoxia, minimizing neurologic injury post arrest, neurologic outcome post arrest, and then neural prognostication after cardiac arrest. So first, we'll start by talking about cerebral hypoxia. So as Dr. Becker mentioned, oxygen is very important for the brain. There's a number of different types of situations in which there could be poor oxygen going to the brain. So one is called hypoxemic hypoxia, where somebody's not breathing a lot and there's poor oxygen going to the brain because they're not breathing appropriately. 
You could also have anemic hypoxia, where there's low levels of oxygen in the blood, and the, uh, there's a, you're losing blood, and therefore there's not good oxygen going to the brain. You have histotoxic hypoxia, where there's chemicals in the body, like carbon monoxide, that's preventing oxygen from going to the brain. And then lastly, ischemic hypoxia, which is what we'll be focusing on today, which is where there's low oxygen delivery to the brain due to low blood flow going to the brain. Now, how does this work? Normally in the body, uh, when depending on what the blood pressure is, if the blood pressure is anywhere in a normal range, so anywhere between slightly low at 50, all the way up to slightly high at 150, inside the brain, the arterioles will regulate themselves to make sure that the blood flow that's going to the brain is the same amount, so that's called autoregulation. So the arterioles will be smaller or larger, depending on what the blood pressure is, to allow for good blood flow and good blood pressure going to the brain. However, when the blood pressure is extremely low or when the blood pressure is extremely high, the arterioles don't respond in a normal fashion. And as a result, there could be too low blood flow going to the brain or too high blood flow going to the brain. The situation that we're talking about here today is when the blood pressure is extremely low, the arterioles don't respond appropriately. And as a result, there's too low blood flow going to the brain. And that's less blood flow than the brain needs in order to respond normally. And so it responds in an ischemic state uh, leading to death of cells. What are the areas of the brain that are most vulnerable to hypoxia? So obviously the brain has a lot of different structures and is responsible for a lot of different things, but there are certain parts of the brain who are particularly vulnerable to hypoxia. So the cerebral cortex, which is responsible for cognition, for language, for movement, and for sensation, is one of the most vulnerable areas of the brain for, to hypoxia. Additionally, the hippocampus, which is responsible for memory, is extremely vulnerable to hypoxia. The basal ganglia, which is responsible for movement, is vulnerable to hypoxia. Lastly, the cerebellum and the thalamus are vulnerable to hypoxia. The cerebellum is involved in movement and balance, and the thalamus is responsible for communicating information from the top of the brain, the cortex, to the base of the brain, the brain stem, and the rest of the body. And therefore, it's involved in consciousness, alertness, memory, movement, and sensation. So as you can see, parts of the brain that are responsible for many, many important actions of the body uh, are vulnerable to hypoxia. So when is the time of injury after cardiac arrest? So as Dr. Becker mentioned, we're not just worried about the time of injury being at the moment when arrest happens. We actually worry about injury even further out from the time after cardiac arrest. So you can see here on this chart, uh, the time of injury is not within just the first few hours after arrest, but rather, we can see that injury can keep on occurring many days after arrest. So even after reperfusion has been established, there still can be ongoing injury to the brain. And this is as a result of two different processes. So first is the issue of what happens at the exact time of the arrest. So this is the ischemic hypoxia. So at the time of a hypoxic event, um, such as cardiac arrest, then there's poor blood flow going to the brain. As a result, a person will respond by losing consciousness because they're having poor blood flow going to the brain. Subsequently, there'll be involvement of problems with the cells, including cellular acidosis, depletion of the ATP store. So ATP is what allows the, the cells to function in a normal fashion to allow energy to go in and out of cells. Additionally, that what will next happen is cytokines. So uh, negative types of factors will influence the cells. Um, leading to depolarization of the neuronal membranes. Subsequently, there can be intracellular influx of sodium, chloride, water, and calcium, and this can then result in cellular swelling and then cellular death. So this is the first part of the time when there's a problem with respect to the ischemic hypoxia. But the second issue is even after reperfusion has been established, after blood flow is returned to the brain, there still can be ongoing injury to the brain, and this can happen as a result of a different set of processes. So this is the result of edema, oxidative injury, and ongoing ischemia. So how can we help to minimize neurologic injury after cardiac arrest? So first, the most important thing at the time of the arrest is high quality CPR. So that was addressed previously. It's important to perform good CPR to improve blood flow going to the brain during the time of the arrest. Uh, and this is based on the good quality CPR is defined based upon the number of uh, the number of compressions done per minute and ensuring that additional measures are employed, such as the use of the defibrillator to reestablish blood flow. And then secondarily, there's a question of neuroprotective strategies, some of which were mentioned in the prior presentation regarding a cocktail that could be employed, and others which will be addressed later by Dr. Brosnahan. 
One thing which was brought up in the last presentation, which is really important to focus on, is uh, therapeutic hypothermia, which can be employed in order to allow there to be improvement of brain resuscitation after cardiac arrest. So the purpose of therapeutic hypothermia, so cooling of the brain, allows the inhibition of the release of dopamine and glutamate, oxidative stress, and free radical reactions, uh, all of which can cause damage to the brain cells. And there were two different studies that were done that we base our information on regarding the use of therapeutic hypothermia, both of which were published in 2002. And what these studies showed us, one which was conducted in Europe and one which was conducted in Australia, showed us that the use of hypothermia, so cooling down the brain, allowed for a better neurologic outcome and also decreased the risk of death after cardiac arrest. Now, as was also mentioned previously, there's different temperatures that potentially we should be cooling to, and we're not really sure. So previously in the initial trials, we cooled to 33, then another trial was done more recently looking at cooling to 36 degrees Celsius to try and see is 36 better, is 33 better, or are they just the same? And what we found was that 36 degrees Celsius was non-inferior to 33 degrees Celsius, so it's no worse than 33 degrees Celsius. So what do we do with that information now? Well, different people do different things. So in general, we want to cool post-arrest, regardless of where an arrest has happened, regardless of whether it was in the hospital or out of the hospital, regardless of the type of cardiac rhythm that person was in at the time of the arrest. However, in terms of the temperature to go to, that varies from hospital to hospital and sometimes varies based upon the, uh, varies based upon the rhythm that the person was in at the time of the arrest, though there's no specific science dictating that. Notably, in terms of when should we not cool post-arrest, so for somebody who was comatose and unresponsive prior to the time of the arrest, that could be a potential situation where it would be reasonable to consider that potentially the risks of cooling could potentially outweigh the benefits, so there can be mixed opinions with respect to that. But more notably, really the only other contraindication to when you would think maybe I shouldn't be cooling this person is if immediately post-arrest, the person wakes up and is following commands, then potentially going ahead and you know, cooling them could cause more harm to them than potential benefit. Obviously, the time in which this happens is pretty infrequent, but nonetheless, it can happen from time to time. So, what can happen to people after their arrests from a neurological perspective? We look at something called the cerebral performance category to be able to assess the range at which people can develop after the arrest. In the best case scenario, patients can have good recovery. So, good recovery is defined as return of consciousness, alertness, Ability to work, ability to function and complete activities of daily living, so taking care of yourself, functioning in the world, and not needing assistance with your basic activities. In the worst case scenario, in grade five, one could progress towards death. Death gets, can be defined either due to loss of function of the heart and lungs, again, or can be defined secondary to complete irreversible loss of function of the brain. Others can be somewhere in between, so can have a moderate disability, severe disability, or can just end up in a permanent coma we'll called a vegetative state. Now, nonetheless, it's important to be aware of the different types of deficits that people can have after their arrest. Now, I spoke previously about the parts of the brain that are most vulnerable to ischemia, and this, of course, is, can correlate to what type of outcomes people can have after their arrest. So patients post-arrest can have Cognitive deficits such as impaired attention, memory, and executive function. There can be difficulties with psychiatric deficits such as depression and anxiety. Patients can develop weakness due to a number of different etiologies, inclusive of the hypoxic injury itself, but also in the setting of cardiac arrest, one can have stroke due to, the, due to poor blood flow to the brain or blood flow to the spine. And then additionally, there could be critical illness polyneuropathy or polymyopathy, which is where patients can have their nerves in their arms and legs be injured as a result, or their muscles be injured as a result of the protracted time period that they remain in the ICU after their cardiac arrest. Patients can also develop myoclonus, which is a type of shaking that can develop after arrest. Sometimes these patients can have these shaking episodes when they're wide awake and functional. Other times they can have depressed mental status and can have these shaking events. Another type of shaking events that can be seen post-arrest are seizures. And then lastly, some patients post-arrest can develop abnormal fluctuations in their blood pressure and heart rate called dysautonomia. Now, additionally, looking back at the prior study that I mentioned, about 50% of the patients uh, who were in this series died. Now, why did they die? 
the majority of these patients died due to withdrawal of life-sustaining therapies. So this means situations in which there was a discussion between the family and the clinicians, the decision was made to withdraw therapeutic support in these circumstances. Now, in trials, we are liking to try and move further away from early withdrawal of life-sustaining therapies because we want to be able to give people more time to be able to demonstrate their ability to recover post-arrest, which will be addressed further in additional presentations today in terms of how to help to prevent that. In some cases, people in this, in this series died secondary to uh, return of uh, or loss of cardiac circulation again and no further um, compressions done at that time. And then a small percentage of patients died secondary to death by neurologic criteria, uh, also known as brain death. So brain death occurs when an individual has complete irreversible loss of function of the entire brain, including the brain stem. This, in this situation, an individual is comatose, has absence of brain stem reflexes, and is unable to breathe spontaneously. Declaration of death by neurologic criteria is declared using, using the criteria created by the American Academy of Neurology for adults and by the, by the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, Society of Critical Care Medicine, and Child Neurology Society for the, a declaration of brain death in pediatric patients. Now, what are risk factors for progression towards brain death after cardiac arrest? A number of studies took a look at which patients were most likely to progress towards brain death and found that factors that were associated with progression towards brain death included female sex, young age, unshockable arrest rhythm, neurologic etiology for arrest, so meaning that the patient had a big stroke or a big bleed, which then led to their heart stopping, or a long arrest time, so a prolonged period of time between the time of their arrest and the return of spontaneous circulation being greater than 30 minutes, so a very protracted arrest period during which CPR is being performed. All right, and then lastly, I'd like to circle to the question of how do we prognosticate? after cardiac arrest. So obviously there's a wide range of potential neurologic outcomes. So how do we help to figure out how somebody is going to recover after an arrest? There's a number of different approaches that can be taken and it's, most, it's important for this evaluation to be multifaceted. So we should utilize our clinical evaluation, we need to utilize imaging, we need to use electrographic criteria, inclusive of an EEG and somatosensory evoked potentials, and then lastly we can use biomarkers. So in terms of our clinical evaluation at the bedside after somebody's had a cardiac arrest, it's important to serially assess them to see whether or not they're performing any activity, whether or not their brain is showing any signs of function. In the ideal scenario, these assessments are being performed off of sedation. Uh, if patients are on sedation at the time of their assessment, then that sedation can limit the exam because the drugs will be in the person's system and so you're not really assessing what's going on just with their brain, you're assessing more as to how their brain is being impacted from these drugs. Additionally, after the arrest, it can take, when somebody's been cooled, it can take some time for that person to bounce back from the cooling period. So you don't necessarily have a good exam on day one or day two after the arrest, but that doesn't mean that going forward you're not going to see clinical improvement. Particularly if this person was on sedation at the time that they were being cooled, because that can take a little while for that sedation to come out of the person's system when they were being cooled. On our assessment, we want to look to see if we see any signs of wakefulness, assess for the ability to follow commands, assess for any brainstem reflexes, so the most primitive portion of the brain. So if you try to poke somebody in the eye, do they blink to demonstrate that their brainstem is intact and that they're, they're showing a reflexive response to you poking them in the eye? If you're irritating the back of their throat, do they cough or gag, demonstrating again a reflexive response that you're irritating them at that point in time? Do they have any ability to move their arms and legs, either on their own or when you stimulate them? Do they pull away from you? Again, looking for either reflexive or intentional responses. And do they show any ability to respond to pain? We also use imaging to help to with prognostication. So CAT scans are one type of imaging modality that we can employ. So I, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of after reperfusion, we worry about one, one concern being edema or swelling of the brain. So when we get CAT scans, we're looking to see if we see any evidence of swelling of the brain. 
So you can see here of the brain after an oxygen injury, you can see there's a lot of swelling in comparison to this normal brain here where we see a lot of nice spaces between different portions of the brain. The black areas are the nice spaces that you can see um, on the left side of the slide um, in comparison to on the right side where you just see a lot of swelling and there's loss of those spaces. An EEG is an electrographic study to look at the brain waves. Uh, we use this after cardiac arrest both to be able to assess to see if patients are having silent seizures and to be able to assist with prognostication. So being able to look at what's going on with the brain waves helps us to have an understanding of how well this person is going to recover. So we, thus, as a result, we like to use continuous EEG, so an ongoing EEG, so we can continue to monitor the brain waves. If there's no ability to have access to ongoing EEG, then we can use routine EEG, so just doing a 30-minute study every day or on an as-needed basis if we see something that's concerning for seizures. In terms of seizures, there can be seizures that are shaking, so events where you see actually the body shaking or jerking or abnormal blinking movements all can be suggestive of seizures. But there can also be silent seizures or non-convulsive seizures, and we can't know that these are happening unless we put an EEG on because they're silent seizures. So the EEG is very important in terms of helping us to know if there's any silent seizures. Additionally, our EEG is helpful in terms of prognostication, so it allows us to help to predict recovery post-arrest. So there's a number of different patterns that can be seen on an EEG in terms of what's going on with the brain waves after an arrest that would be concerning to us. So you can see here in, in uh, the first block here, A, this is a severely suppressed background. So this is just a very flat line. This is not showing us a lot of activity of the brain waves. This is concerning. Um, in, in sample B here, you can see that the background is pretty flat, it's still suppressed, but these findings that we see here are called periodic discharges, and these discharges are concerning to us because this demonstrates the potential for having seizures. It's not showing us any normal brain waves here, it's showing just the potential for seizures superimposed on a very slow brain. A slow brain. Um, in, in sample C here, you can see this is called a burst suppression pattern, so everything looks very suppressed, the brain waves are very, very slow, and then you see this little area of a burst indicating that there's some activity, but nonetheless having this, this pattern is indicative of a poor brain. And then in the sample D here, you can see again that there's suppression, and then there's periodic discharges, also of which are problematic. So performing an EEG can be helpful in order to understand better what's going on with the brain. Similarly, we can perform something called somatosensory evoked potentials, which allows us to understand electrographically whether information is being transmitted from the periphery into the brain and whether the brain is able to respond to that information. So somatosensory evoked potentials involves uh, a provision of a stimulus in the arm and then you look to see if you're seeing a response in the brain. And if you're seeing a response in the brain, then that's a representative of the brain having intact ability to get that information. Lastly, there's a biomarker called neuron-specific enolase, which can be elevated in the setting of injury to the brain, and this can be helpful to us to have a sense as to the extent of injury to which the brain has suffered. Prognostication is very challenging, though. As you can see, you have to employ a lot of different modalities, and it's really important to delay your prognostication after the arrest to allow for the period of recovery before you make this assessment. So in summary, cardiac arrest causes injury to the brain both due to poor blood flow at the time of the arrest and after the time of reperfusion. So both at the, at the moment of the arrest and many days later. Therapeutic hypothermia can help to prevent injury to the brain after cardiac arrest. Patients who survive cardiac arrest can have a wide range of neurologic outcomes, with the worst being brain, brain death. Most deaths after cardiac arrest, however, are the result of withdrawal of life-sustaining therapy. So the use of additional therapies and cocktails could be helpful in order to allow more time for people to recover post-arrest. And then lastly, neuroprognostication after cardiac arrest can be confusing and challenging, and so it's important to allow for a protracted period post-arrest before prognosticating. Thank you. What you've heard really uh, today is that what you're beginning to see is, you know, uh, when I look back over the last 20 years, um, we thought death was very easy. You know, your heart stops, you stop breathing, and as a result of that, of course, you lose your brain stem reflex. Your brain doesn't work. And that's how we declare people there based on those criteria. You see the doctor shine the light on the eyes, you get fixed to guide people, and we declare them there. 
And what you're hearing now is this shift in our understanding where there's this tremendous opportunity now to actually intervene in this continuum, this process that's occurring. And what Dr. Lewis uh, summarized for us really wonderfully is the fact that there's so much happening, there's this new battleground, and there's so much happening that's complicated that we have to try to address. Now, one of the things I do want to point out, and, and, and leading up to our next speaker, is the fact that the, the relationship between the period that you have no oxygen coming to your brain and your organs, and the complications that occur later are like an earthquake and a tsunami. We're now recognizing there's a lot you can do for the tsunami. A few years back, I heard about pioneering research that Dr. Sam Tishman has been doing in Maryland, at the University of Maryland, and I'm delighted that he's accepted our invitation to come here, because what you see is that, of course, people, you hear about these amazing cases in the media where people basically collapsed, died, and then they were found hours later and were brought back. But they were all in the cold environment. You know, their body temperature could decline. And I realized that he's doing fascinating research, taking, essentially, people who have had hemorrhagic shock, they've bled out from trauma, uh, and trying to actually preserve them, cool them down, and then slowly bring them back and warm them up later. That's emergency preservation and resuscitation research that he's been pioneering. And I'm, again, really delighted that you've accepted our offer to come. He is a professor at the University of Maryland and at the Shock Trauma Center. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sam, and thank you, the New York Academy of Sciences. It's a great honor and privilege to get to speak to you this afternoon. Uh, so, well, I'm going to talk about, kind of tell you a story of how we got to where we are with looking at what we call now emergency preservation and resuscitation. We initially call it suspended animation, other people still do, but we're trying to get away from the sci-fi notion of suspended animation. I do have to disclose a couple things. I'm a co-author of a patent for our methodology, uh, which won't get me anything, but I just have to say it. And we have grant support from the U.S. Department of Defense, and I also should, I guess, to close my, my bias with like Lance, I believe that the limits are not just 10 minutes. So, so just to be clear, I'm not going to be talking about suspend animation to send people off to Jupiter and have them wake up when they get there. I'm um, also, also not going to talk about freezing people until the, whatever caused them to die is now being cured 50 years later. What I'm going to talk about is just figuring out how we can buy time to save people who are dying in front of us and we just can't fix them quickly enough. That's why it's a very important issue for trauma patients. So here's a, a, an example of a case, and this is uh, actually a case that I was involved with. I was a surgical resident. I actually spent, I was at the University of Pittsburgh, but we spent a couple of months at the Shock Trauma Center at the University of Maryland, and distinctly remember this young patient who came in, stabbed him with the heart. We did all the right things. He was at and one of the busiest and the best trauma centers in the world, and we couldn't save them. It was some sort of fight over some bowling shoes. But you know, it, it's, it's very frustrating as a trauma surgeon, as a resuscitation person, to have somebody young and healthy a few minutes ago now dying in front of us. And little had been done to try to improve our outcome from these kinds of cases. Well, it just so happened that when I was a medical student, <clears throat> I answered an ad, and those of you old enough to recall, there was a little piece of paper on a cork board on the wall. It wasn't uh, via the internet or anything like that. Looking for medical students to do cardiac arrest research. And I answered the ad and met this guy, who's Peter Saffer, who's known as the father of CPR. And this is a quick other historical point. The painting behind him here is the painting of a girl from the River Seine, a girl who died in the river. Nobody ever knew who she was. But they used her face, her death mask, to design the face of Assassin for all of us who have taken CPR courses. This is really got Annie's face. And in deference to Lance's comment about we've been really interested in the brain for the last 20 years, well, in 1961, when the ABCs of CPR put together, and Dr. Saffer was one of the key people proposing this, he went to A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. It's 1961, H. Hypothermia, start within 30 minutes if the patient's not waking up. So the idea has been around, it was kind of dormant for a long time, but it's been around for a long time. And we've already kind of heard a little bit about the current Heart Association guidelines of if you have a patient who's comatose, not waking up, not, meaningful, not having meaningful responses to 
uh, commands that we should cool them down, or at least control the temperature between 32 and 36, and do this for 24 hours and then prevent fever thereafter. So that's now pretty much the standard of care post arrest in non trauma patients. Trauma patients are different. If you've lost so much blood that your heart now does not beat, pushing on the chest isn't going to do much of anything. But we, we do it, but it doesn't have any good outcomes. And we know the outcome from cardiac arrest trauma is really bad. We do things more aggressively with trauma patients. Probably because we can, we're certain we can cut it anything we want to. But we open the chest in the trauma bay, and we do that because we hope to find something we can fix, but also we can directly massage the heart to get better blood flow, and we can clamp the aorta so that whatever blood is in the circulation will go to the heart and brain, obviously the most uh, vulnerable organs to no blood flow. But the outcomes are terrible. This is a, a review paper 20 years ago from Peter Reed, and overall 7% survival. If you do all that stuff, put breathing tube in, give them blood, open the chest, all that stuff, less than 7%. And at shock trauma, I looked at the data there, it's less than 5%. It hasn't changed in 20 years. So we've got to do something better. So to try to get some idea of how we might do something better, Peter Saffer, along with Ron Bellamy, who's a colonel in the US Army, looking at some data from the Vietnam War, looked at when soldiers who died of injuries were killed in action, when did they actually die? And yeah, there are some that died immediately and they get injuries we're not going to be able to fix. But if you look at this graph, there are people who died five minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. That's a time frame in which if you had something novel you could do just to kind of stop the clock, buy some time, maybe you could save them. The other really important point is a lot of them, they actually did autopsies on, on all of them. They are, often had injuries that are fixable. So you got somebody that's got an injury that's fixable, but you just don't have time to fix it. So what can we do to, to try to save them? And that's where we came around with this, this term that we now call emergency preservation resuscitation, or protection, the preservation of the whole body during a period of no blood flow, maybe two hours, maybe longer, to allow transportation, control of bleeding, and then delay resuscitation. And hopefully people will survive, otherwise lethal injuries. Again, all we're doing is trying to buy time. So how can we do it? Well, we came up with a magic potion and maybe some that magic cocktail we could do it, but we don't have that yet. So our initial thought was, what about hypothermia? So there were several influences on why we thought hypothermia could be the answer. One being hypothermia with cardiac arrest, as we've already been hearing about this. Uh, if you haven't seen this picture, this is a picture of a patient who had a cardiac arrest in a grocery store and the enthusiastic medics threw piles of frozen french fries on him to start cooling him down before they even transported him. We also know that there are many reports of people drowning in cold water, being underwater for an hour or more, and then being resuscitated. So if you cool fast enough, you can survive a long period of no blood flow. And then circuitry arrest, our cardiac surgeons have been stopping all the circulation in the body for 50 years just to be able to operate on the heart and the aorta. So using all that, it seemed to us like hypothermia could be the answer. Now hypothermia does a lot more things than just decreasing the metabolism, which is the main thing we're thinking about, and, and this has already been mentioned today, but you decrease metabolic rate, decrease inflammation, decrease oxidative stress, and reperfusion injury, decrease cell death. But certainly in the trauma world, there's a bit of an yin and yang with hypothermia because it causes cardiopathy, the blood doesn't clot as well when you're cold, so you can bleed more, they're stressed, they're shivering. And in the trauma world, we teach all of our trainees that there's this triad of death, that if you get acidotic, you get cardiopathic, your, your blood can't clot well, and you're hypothermic, you're gonna die. So we try to prevent this. This is the, the surgical trauma dogma right now. But if you look at the data, yes, the higher the injury severity score, lower the temperature, and the worse the mortality, but really is the mortality just because of the other things that cause you to lose temperature than the actual temperature effect itself. Now I'll posit to you that there's a big difference between exposure hypothermia, which is what we're talking about on trauma patients, or here's Napoleon's men, versus therapeutic hypothermia, which will add 10 years to your life. Which certainly in the trauma world, this is what this sounds like. But we, Ignore that, and, and took this to the lab. This is just a picture of Peter Saffer all the way on the left here, along with some of our techs and fellows who did a lot of this work in the lab, and 
Pakahanic, there's a middle on the right, is now the direct to the Sapper Center. And we came up with this idea, the fastest way we could cool the whole body, particularly the brain and the heart, would be just to flush the body with cold fluid, just cold saline is what we use, it's salt water. And if you put a catheter way up in the aorta, you could do this, and you could, if you want to, have a balloon there so you get the heart and brain cold fast. What we found is that once we started to do a longer period of no blood flow, we had issues because we weren't protecting the spinal cord, we weren't protecting the gut. So most of the studies that we did, we just cooled the whole body as fast as possible, just with pumping in a large amount of cold fluid. This is a diagram of what we're talking about, of the pink line being the blood pressure, the animal bleeds, we actually induce particular fibrillation, so the heart actually stops at exactly the time we say it stops. Wait a couple minutes, then flush them with this cold fluid, get them down to the goal temperature with that study, and then leave them there. And we went from 15 minutes up to three hours. Just three hours of no blood flow. Plenty of time for us to go off and have a nice leisurely lunch, come back and resuscitate them. But clinically, that would be the time where you're rushing to the operating room and you're trying to stop the bleeding. And when they're as cold as we took them, then you got to restore blood flow using the heart lung machine, a cardiac pulmonary bypass. And we continue mild hypothermia at 34, at 34 for at least 12 hours. And it's easy to march out kind of a dose response. That if you just want 15 minutes of no blood flow, you have to cool down to about 34 degrees. But when we're talking about 90 minutes, two hours of no blood flow, we're talking about cooling the brain to 10 degrees centigrade, which is about 50 Fahrenheit, very cold temperatures. But it takes a ton of fluid to do that. And I won't go into all the studies that we did, but uh, Peter Saffer and Pat Kahanek, after drinking a couple of bottles of red wine, came up with this simplified diagram <laughs> of what's going on in the brain with ischemia and reperfusion. And based on that, actually everything on here is theoretically correct, but <laughs> came up with a whole bunch of drugs to look at. We didn't do a, little, a lot with combining them, but maybe that is part of the answer. The only drug that seemed to have a little bit of benefit was Temple, so a powerful antioxidant. But really, it's the hypothermia. Now, I'll just say one quick study that we did is really important to where we are today, where we actually added some trauma to this. So this a study of prolonged hemorrhagic shock to the point of no blood flow. <clears throat> uh, and then we actually randomized the animals to getting CPR, giving them their own blood back, doing what we would do with our patients, or cool them down, leave them there for another hour of no blood flow, and then resuscitate all of them with the heart lung machine. And just to make it more realistic, we actually opened the abdomen, injured the spleen, and took the spleen out later. So it was really trauma, really hammered, really cardiac arrest. And this is the overall performance category, similar to the serial performance categories now used in patients. One is good, five is bad, and you can see that with CPR, none of them survive. With EPR, sorry, uh, they did well, they mostly survived. If we had 12 hours of post arrest mild hypothermia, some of them had neurologic deficits. They did much better if you have prolonged post-arrest mild hypothermia. We're not the only ones looking at this. Hassan Alam, Peter Reed done some similar work. Uh, they used a fancy fluid that's got a whole bunch of goodies in there for cold and for store. Uh, that's actually designed for storing uh, organs for organ transplantation now. They had an open chest model. But they found a couple things that are really important in terms of taking this to the clinical world, the faster you cool, the better in terms of survival. Rewarming, probably want to go kind of medium in terms of how fast you rewarm. But they also did a study where they did added a bunch of injuries. They fixed all the injuries and all the animals were cold, and they reproduced them and they did, did well. So we thought it was time to take this to our patients. So this is a study that we're currently doing at the Star Trauma Center at the University of Maryland. It's called the Emergency Preservation and Resuscitation for Cardiac Arrest and Trauma Trial, the EPR CAT. Our aims are to rapidly identify patients who might be candidates for this within five minutes of losing a pulse. To then cool them down as fast as possible to get the brain down to 10 to 15 degrees centigrade, so again, 50, 55, 58 uh, Fahrenheit, using just a flush of ice cold saline, stop the bleeding, and then resuscitate them with our lung machine. And obviously our goal is that people survive, and not just survive, but they survive without significant neurologic deficits and go back to being normal healthy people. For the moment anyway, we're looking at patients with penetrating trauma, 18 to 65 years of age, and have to have had signs of life within five minutes of getting to the hospital. We're trying to thread that fine line between doing something to somebody that's going to do well anyway, 
or doing something to somebody that's going to die no matter what we do, and trying to help the ones in between. And again, we're not trying to resuscitate people who are dead. We're trying to stop people who are in the process of dying from dying in front of us. The usual kinds of exclusion for this kind of study, but we clearly don't want people with traumatic brain injury or a sicily, which means they've probably been in arrest a lot longer than we think they've been in arrest. And pregnancy and prisoners are the usual kind of exclusions. Again, it's similar to the animal model. The patients are bleeding, they lose a pulse, we open the chest, we don't get them back immediately, we say, okay, we're gonna do EPR, we flush them with the ice cold fluid, rush them to the operating room and resuscitate them in delayed fashion using bypass. This is a diagram showing how we put this cannula directly into the aorta, because in the trauma patient, we've already opened the chest. The heart's right there, the aorta's right there. Very easy for us to do this. And it's also easy for us to just open up a small part of the right side of the heart, let it all drain out, and then we suction that, that blood out. We're looking for survival without neurologic deficits, direct complications, coagulation problems, organ failures, but ideally long-term survival without significant neurologic dysfunction. As you can imagine, this takes a huge team. We've got the trauma surgeons, we've got the trauma resuscitation unit, trauma anesthesiologists, perfusionists, cardiac surgeons, the operating room staff, cardiac anesthesiologists, blood bank, and many, many others. So we have to train everybody together. This is a picture we took the first time we did a training session. This is almost 10 years ago that we did this. And our goal right now, this is the way that we've designed the study with the FDA, is that we're gonna enroll 10 people who get EPR, and then 10 patients who meet the same criteria, but we don't have a whole team around. So I'm part of the team, I'm not there. Like today, if somebody rolled in and met the criteria, we could enroll that person as a control patient. We're also looking at historical controls. So one final couple comments here. To do a study like this, we obviously can't get consent from the patients. So the process we have to go through community consultation, public disclosure, and once things get out into the news, to the press, it's hard to control what happens with it. So this, this study, <laughs> this um, article came out, uh, Killing a Patient Saved His Life. My second day of working at the University of Maryland, our, our media office was really excited to see me that day. Uh, when we did our, our community consultation in Baltimore, we made it on the front page of the Sun. You also have to give people the option of opting out. But as I said, once it's out there, it's out there. And even TV shows can pick up on it. Put it in some suction. I'm replacing all the patient's blood with ice cold saline. Who can tell me why? The theory of cold infusion that can create a temporary suspension of animation. Bingo. That's a man on the table, the app. We're going to kill him to save him. The cold infusion. It's an experimental procedure. So he's right. <laughs> <laughs> this was this is the first patient on the first episode of the TV show Code Black. And there's also one on uh, Grey's Anatomy. I would say both of those patients survived. That's I, think we're, I think we're two for two. <laughs> so so you know, we're, we're obviously still working on the study. We're, we are doing it. We're learning a lot as we're moving it forward. But we certainly hope that this kind of approach of basically just trying to stop the clock by time with hypothermia, maybe with drugs or other ways to do this, will allow us to save the trauma patients that are currently dying in front of us. It may actually be some benefit, help benefit to other patients. And once we can prove this works here, we can expand the utility of this technique. But hopefully, in the future, we're going to have patients survive that otherwise would not. Thank you very much. very much, Sam. This was really fascinating. I mean, to think about the, the five-minute rule that we are currently all still told, and to look at what's being done to try to essentially suspend the process by which cells are dying uh, and try to save uh, the underlying condition, if it's reversible and bring a person back. Uh, before we go to the next talk, we wanted to just uh, give some time for any questions and answers that you may have had. I was going to ask the speakers, the first three speakers perhaps, to maybe come forward so that you can ask questions uh, if the audience have any questions. Yeah. Okay. 
Yes, please. Is the mic working? Chuck, Chuck, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, Chuck Melvin, I'm a journalist and an instructor at Marquette University and a uh, cardiac arrest survivor. Um, thank you all for uh, terrific uh, uh, presentations. Um, I think this one's for Lance uh, Becker. Um, uh, you talked about the ECMO machine, and I've read a little bit about it. Um, what I haven't heard is um, you mentioned the difficulty of deploying it. How expensive is a single ECMO machine, and is it realistic for us to think that these are going to spread across the country uh, and it w with any uh, deliberate uh, yes. So uh, first of all, thank you for coming. Terrific, and it's great to have something you, you should talk about your experience, you know what I mean? Like, you don't want to hear from me. Um, but in terms of the ECMO machine, um, here, here's what I'd say is that what is the cost of the first telephone? You know, what is the cost of the first rocket to the moon? What is the cost of any first technology? So right now it costs about uh, between ten and $15,000 to put somebody on this. But what is, um, and that's kind of, that's like what, and to be honest, like my hospital would be really happy with that, okay? Because that doesn't include the cost of, guess what? Keeping in the ICU for all of that time. And so at the end of the day, when a person goes through this whole procedure, just like they probably would for some of these other procedures, or many patients who just are critically ill, they're gonna end up with an ICU bill that is fairly substantial. And yes, even in America, you wanna have insurance. You know what I mean? So I, I think that that's a realistic consideration, but I think the thing to really think about is how the cost comes down as these things spread out. And so, you know, remember the first defibrillator costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, and now you can buy one for under a thousand dollars, you know? And so the question is, what will it be in the future? And I just think that's the only way to model it as you think about it. Uh, a, real, a real quick follow, and, and if you could address it too. Um, <laughs> Uh, do you have any idea what? How many of these things are deployed at at, at this point? Maybe in a percentage. How many hospitals? I, have? I don't know about any numbers, idea? but, but the, the machine, the technology is ubiquitous in hospitals. So there because because cardiac surgeons are using the same technology. A little bit of nuance difference if they're using it for ECMO and if they're doing it for CPR. But it's really the same thing. And I, what I was going to add was the cost isn't really so much the device. It's the people because it's it's a team. It's a huge team. And if you put somebody on ECMO, you know, you've got more intense nursing than you would have in other patients. You've got the ECMO techs, and you have a lot of other people that you don't have with other patients. It's really, the people is what adds up quickly. Let me ask a question, if I can. Then. So uh, I'll direct this question to Sam, if I may. Um, you said that you have a sort of you've chosen a five minute rule, and I understand because for any research study we have to start at some point and we can't go from zero to one. But how, how do you see this? I mean, because we don't really know when someone has become irreversibly damaged from a cellular perspective. Just can you share with us your thoughts about how you see this might go in the future? You know, and could could what you're doing now or what you're trying to do have much more um, more generalizable um, application to other people who die from, who would otherwise have died from a reversible or treatable medical condition? So admittedly, uh, our criteria were pretty arbitrary. Um, right now, we're just trying to figure out how to do this and show that we can do it, not necessarily improve it's better than not doing it. That would be the next step, because this is obviously way out there in terms of doing something that it's not what trauma surgeons normally do. It's not what cardiac surgeons normally do. They don't normally work together like this. So just kind of seeing if we can do it. To do that, we wanted to come up with at least our first shot at what patient population has the best chance of benefit from this. And we've debated about whether we should broaden it at this point or not. Uh, and we felt like, let's just get the technique down first. And then we can think about it at longer times different types of trauma patients. I mean, one big thing in the trauma world is penetrating trauma, meaning a shot, a gunshot wound or a stab wound versus a long trauma like a car accident or a fall. We want to stay away from head injuries because we don't know what all this is going to do to the brain. I mean, it works fine in the lab for the brain, 
But if you have an injured brain from trauma, is it going to be different? We don't know. But we could broaden it to other types of, not types of trauma patients, that sort of thing. But right now, we just want to show that we can, the technique can work, and then we'll figure out where to go. And then thinking about going beyond trauma to refractory cardiac arrest or certain type toxic things where you really need to stop the circulation, be able to get rid of whatever the evil toxin is. Those are the kinds of ideas that we thought about, but that's down the road. So just to think about it a little bit, one of our last two really unfortunate cases in our emergency department were two individuals who came in separately in their 20s who had uh, one intentionally and one non-intentionally overdosed on some drugs and had stopped breathing. And so these are very, very young individuals who um, very likely you would love to offer them a second chance. And really with both of them, we get, you know, really considered, you know, moving uh, into this sort of category of doing the advanced kind of resuscitation. And because of just the inability to get all of the moving pieces together, we were unable to offer it to those two young people. Time of day, not having the right people around. It's just, so So that that's really where the, the cost uh, is in this right now. It's not, it's not that all the little pieces, all the little tools were scattered around the hospital in different places, but they just weren't all together, you know? And um, would, would they have been successful? Well, you know, you, you don't know, but there certainly are stories of people just like that that have been successful. But let's just, let's also look at the flip side. If it was not successful for a minute, we haven't talked about it, but it also offers up the opportunity to uh, salvage some very good organs that can be used to help transplant people who need other kinds of organs. And there's an incredible shortage of livers and kidneys and um, hearts and all kinds of important organs and people are literally dying in this country because of the inability to simply have organs and that certainly what Sam is doing will perfectly preserve organs because you couldn't ask for a better liver than a liver from a trauma patient who's now been cooled down to what 10 degrees or something like that and if, if you were unable to resuscitate that person we will you know we could we could solve the organ shortage in this country with this kind of technology uh, literally in a year. So I just think we have to think beyond uh, maybe some of our current models. I've got one more and I, I promise not to dominate. That's fine. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, I know when I was in the, uh, in the ER, um, uh, well the ER doc later uh, described it as organized chaos. Um, it's, it's sort of a frantic atmosphere, and yet I would really have loved to have had an EEG or some measurement of what was going on in my brain at that moment, uh, uh, and uh, not just for the uh, sake of the oxygenation and that sort of thing, the, the, the health of the brain, but also so we can measure what's going on in the brain and find out uh, what processes are still uh, happening as the heart is not working. Um, is it realistic to think that we can get to a point where we can measure what's going on in the brain? Like for instance, the, you mentioned the NIRS thing, the NIRS, and I, yeah, I think uh, maybe a doctor on this might be, but uh, anyhow, is it, is it possible to uh, uh, measure that uh, at this point? Is it feasible? Uh, so actually, Dr. Parnia is uh, probably the right person to talk to about use of NIRS during cardiac arrest. I think um, it definitely is possible. Um, and that, I think, as, as Lance pointed out, a lot of us are realizing that you have to be able to monitor what you're doing. You wouldn't fly a plane without some kind of navigation system, yet constantly we're, we're performing resuscitation and CPR on people without navigation. So yes, that's possible, and it's things that have been developed. And I'll touch on it on some of that on the later talk today. Maybe we'll go to the next uh, topic. Or no, he's the world's leader in this. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to ask anything? Did you have a question? I'm sorry. So uh, a quick question. Uh, so Tom After Heidi, uh, I'm an emergency physician at the Medical College of Wisconsin. The question was for Sam. I'm absolutely fascinated. This is landmark work. Um, how long do you keep the patients on your uh, saline ECMO? Uh, 
uh, number one, and then when do you uh, and how do you rewarm the patient? So the saline part is just to get them cold, and once they're cold, we just disconnect everything, roll down the hall of the operating room, and the way we've worked out, again, this, this is the manpower issue. We have a perfusionist and the trauma team doing the cooling, while at the same time, we've got another perfusionist in the operating room getting a standard heart lung machine ready to go. So during that time, there's no flow going on, roll down the hall, get in the operating room, and now we've got two teams operating, the trauma team doing the trauma thing, and the cardiac surgeons working with their team to put the patient on standard open chest uh, cardiopulmonary bypass with their standard circuit. So that the saline will be gone, and then as soon as we turn that circuit on, they're getting blood, and that circuit will control the reperfusion, the rewarming, everything from there. Um, I'm not sure to which, whom, I think the um, doctor on the right there, yeah. So I'm a chaplain at Mount Sinai, and I work a lot with ECMO patients and, neuro, and the neurosurgery ICU unit too, and so I just felt compelled to comment that on the other side of it, um, you know, I've seen ECMO patients, um, you know, become a little bit better, but maybe not quite better to get off the machine, and it is such a trauma to sometimes the patient most definitely to the families, and then incredibly so sometimes to the st that staff you're talking about when they can't survive it. You know, I understand that the, the um, you know, that all of their organs are probably doing really, really well, but what about the trauma to the, um, to the psyche of these people? Well, that's a, so, so first, thank you for your comment, and, you know, trying to think of what we do to uh, help families as they, you know, it's, it's, it's just very difficult with a family to have a patient in that kind of critical condition. And whether they're on ECMO or just in between life and death uh, is, uh, is a very challenging time. I mean, I don't, there's nothing enjoyable about my shift in the emergency department when I have to go give a family bad news, like nothing. And so, um, so I, I understand. Uh, I think that uh, families take a certain amount of solace, if you will, in knowing that you've done everything you can, that you've brought every technology that you can to their loved one, and that um, you know that you know higher powers, if you will, have sort of made the decision to turn which way that how that patient actually turned out. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's a unique situation. But this is a technology that can sort of expand that in-between time. And I suppose there's a simplicity, if you will, in just having someone drop dead, and, and that's it. And you don't have to explain a lot of very difficult things. But I don't see us moving sort of backwards at this point in terms of our technology, you know, and so I think uh, we're going to need more chaplains that can do a good job of explaining. I think we'll, just if I can ask just very briefly, because we've gone over on our questions and answers time, if you don't mind. Um, just got a comment. My name's Harvey Zarr. I actually used to be at the Safford Center for Resuscitation Research, and I actually was an anesthesiologist when Sam was a surgical resident. <laughs> and uh, I also, before I went to medical school, I had an engineering background. A lot of the challenges here um, are either organizational or technical in terms of making a piece of equipment that would serve very efficiently in the situation involved. Cardiopulmonary bypass is actually a very basic uh, technology. It's based on Langendorf perfused organs, which is a 19th century technology, and the oxygenator was developed bubble oxygenator at the University of Minnesota by putting in a surfactant so the blood wouldn't bubble, okay? And that was back in the 60s, I believe. So some of these things are coming up with a more modern, more efficient thing. The problem as I see it, and I've fought against this problem my whole life in medicine, is engineers and doctors do not communicate very well. 
Um, a lot of these problems are actually fairly simple to solve in terms of like it's pumps, it's cannulas, it's well proven technology. You have to sit there and design something. So I would just say um, try to find somebody you can actually talk to and explain your problem and talk back to you and suggest the appropriate technology. Uh, because the need for sensors and measuring these things, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, and there's like stuff that's modern now, like a lot of pressure centers, you could make a patch that you could slap on somebody's uh, chest, put a couple wires, and sense the pressure which you're doing CPR. So anyway, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Good to see you, it's been a while, Harvey, we don't see how long, but that's a great point. I mean, we, we definitely need to engage with people from other professions to make all this stuff work. Thank you very much for your presentations. And for so we've heard um, a lot, lot of really amazing advances that I think it's going to take really decades for us to figure out the implications of everything that's been done. Um, one of the things that happens, at least certainly from the medical perspective, is that we're dealing with essentially a body most of the time in the, in the middle of the resuscitation. And it's hard to lose perspective on the fact that there's a human there. Um, so what we I'd, I'd like to do is I'm delighted that we have somebody here who went through a very prolonged cardiac arrest and who would, under most circumstances, uh, because of the fact that she did not have her heart restarted quickly, um, or even relatively quickly, within say 10, 15 minutes, um, she would not have probably been here. But as it happens, she's gone through a lot of the things that we've talked about. And I won't give any more information, but I will ask her to come and spend maybe five or 10 minutes to tell us about her story and how it is that she's here today. But I do want to say that it's been almost 10 years since her cardiac arrest, since her prolonged cardiac arrest. And she's fully active in society. She works in tech. And if you think about other conditions, like think about something like cancer, if you have a 10-year survival after cancer, it's really remarkable after chemotherapy treatment. And here we have somebody who's 10 years out of a cardiac arrest, which would otherwise be thought of as completely fatal. So I want to introduce you to Sherry. Uh, please, Sherry, come, Sherry, Amy, and come and tell us about what happened. Sherry and I. Um, like Dr. Parnia said, I am a 10-year cardiac arrest survivor. Um, I'm also um, a 10-year, um, or probably 11-year now, uh, cancer survivor. So I'm, I'm both. <laughs> um, it's been an honor to, to, number one, be invited here today to speak alongside all of the the doctors, medical researchers, scientists, um, and to hear the behind the scenes of what it took to save my life. Um, I have to admit it's a little weird at the same time to, um, I know my version of this story, right? But to hear really how much goes into uh, bringing somebody back from cardiac arrest is absolutely incredible. So I just want to share my story. Um, and I have a big message at the end, um, at the end of my story that I think is very, very important. So it was the spring of 2010. Um, I was uh, about 10 months out of my last chemotherapy treatment for Hodgkin's lymphoma. I had been given um, 12 rounds of chemotherapy. There's four different um, medicines that I was treated with, and one of them actually has um, a history of possibly causing heart failure. Um, I was definitely checked for that uh, over the course of the 10 months, but what happened to me came on pretty suddenly. I had about three weeks of having trouble breathing um, in which I went to the local emergency room, but um, the correct tests really weren't run on me. 
Um, I was in my early 30s, and even though I just had chemotherapy, I looked very healthy, I looked young, and you know, sometimes these things are just overlooked. Um, and so I went home, and I still, for about the next three weeks, had difficulty breathing. And there was one morning where my husband found me walking down the hallway where I was complaining of both of my arms feeling heavy. And he immediately rushed me to the emergency room of my local hospital. But on the way there, he actually called my, uh, my, my local cardiologist, who I'm going to refer to as Dr. X, <laughs> um, just for reference, because his name is going to come up a lot. Um, he, he happened to be on call, which was very, very rare, because he was the uh, chief of cardiology of the hospital. Um, and I believe this was a weekend. So first miracle was that he happened to be on call. He said to my husband to bring me to the emergency room, to rush me there, and that he would meet us there. Uh, we arrived into the emergency room. I was whisked away into a room where um, I, this is the one part I remember of that day, and that is that the nurse wanted me to lay down on the uh, hospital bed so that she could put the IV in. And um, I remember saying to her, I can't lie down because I'm having trouble breathing. And she said, no, 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 it'll just be for a couple of seconds. I said, okay. And I laid down and I immediately could not breathe. And I remember my husband standing in front of me and I reached up my arms and I said, help me up, help me, help me, help me, I can't breathe. And he came over and he helped uh, uplift um, the upper part of my body. And at that point, according to my father, my eyes rolled back into my head and my heart had stopped. Um, now I was not attached to any monitors at the time and the nurse who was um, putting in the IV was getting pre everything prepared, so she had her back to me and didn't realize that I had flatlined. Um, so my family let her know, and immediately, <laughs> right away, <laughs> something's not right here. And um, immediately a code blue was, was issued, and again, from what I'm told, it was uh, organized chaos. Um, Cardiac, uh, at the time that I flatlined and there was a code blue issue, it happened to also be the exact time that Dr. X, my cardiologist, had come running into the emergency room. CPR was immediately um, administered and they would get my heart to start and then it would stop again. So. What was happening was it, could, it wouldn't stick. And so after about, I don't know, 10 to 20 minutes, um, the medical staff decided to call my time of death. And now with Dr. X in the emergency room, he happened to be the one doctor in the entire emergency room that refused to give up. And I want you to really understand that he was the only one because the hospital had never seen anything like a crash like mine and then for the chief of cardiology to say keep going no one actually knew what to do so with him again in the words of my father dr. X performed like a drill sergeant. And he ordered every single person in that emergency room and told them exactly what to do because everyone had actually frozen up. They didn't know. So he instructed this person to do that, this person to do that, that person get back on her and you know, continue with the chest compressions. And they continued these chest compressions for over 90 minutes. And they did this long enough where they eventually took me into the operating room and uh, they were ordered to continue with the chest compressions 
long enough for Dr. X to install the ECMO. Um, once the ECMO was installed, um, the oxygen was now able to get to my organs, except there was no heartbeat. Um, so at this point, I'm, I'm now in obviously a coma and uh, no heartbeat and on the ECMO. So Dr. X pulls my family aside and says, um, she's on the ECMO, but there's really nothing more we can do for her in this particular hospital. And by a miracle, he happened to also teach once a month down at New York Presbyterian Hospital, uh, Columbia University Medical Center here. Um, and a few calls were made, and um, the cardiothoracic team uh, eventually sent um, their uh, head of <coughs> cardiothoracic surgery and the uh, surgical team up via ambulance to get me. Um, as soon as they arrived, they, and mind you now, to give you timing, this is now the next day. I don't understand that, but <laughs> I think you guys probably understand that more than I. But this is how many hours now has, has gone by. So they come up and get me, they hook me up to their ECMO, take me back down via ambulance, where uh, they called my husband and said, follow us down, um, and do we have your, your permission to perform uh, open heart surgery on your wife? Now, just to set the stage um, from my family's perspective, they did not realize at this time that I had no heartbeat. <laughs> so they're just kind of thinking, oh, she's fine. I mean, she was just fine. Like, a second ago, she just had trouble breathing. So even though like New York Presbyterian Hospital came up to get me, my husband was thinking maybe they're just taking her down there to give her a pacemaker. So that's kind of the mental state of my family at this time, um, that I had no heartbeat. I was on ECMO. So he's shocked, but gives the okay to um, perform open heart surgery. And I was immediately rushed into the OR upon arrival at New York Presbyterian Hospital, where records definitely show um, there was no atrial and no ventricle movement with my heart. They performed open heart surgery on me for 16 to 18 hours, which was a very long time from what I was told. Um, and when I came out, uh, I was attached to a central mag, um, as well as the ECMO, and I was still in very critical condition, um, but they could not find out during the open heart surgery why my heart wouldn't restart. So while I was out of surgery, I still had no heartbeat. Um, <laughs> so, it, it's never easy to tell this story. Um, so there was one point where I was bleeding out of my pores um, and they could not figure out why I just wouldn't stop bleeding everywhere. And it turned out that during the CPR, um, my lungs were punctured. And so I had internal bleeding. And it took them a little bit to figure out that that's where the bleeding was coming from. So they stopped the air to flow to my lungs and immediately put me on a ventilator. And I remained on the ventilator, the ECMO, the Centromag, um, and just trees of uh, medicines and fluids uh, pretty much for the next three months. Um, in a coma, in and out of a coma. And um, it was really unknown if I would survive. And, you know, if I did survive, what would be the damage? So during that time, um, 
I remember being in isolation. I remember having um, C. diff and just all these things. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. And when I tell you, my family did not know if I would survive for at least two and a half months. Um, it, it was tough. Um, they were told by the staff and by the um, cardiothoracic surgeons that uh, they felt that I had a fighting chance and they felt with the latest and advanced uh, technology and resuscitation that I could pull through. They were very, very optimistic with my family um, and now that I've, I've, I know them now, um, you know, they've told me a little bit more about how nervous they were, but um, they were very, very positive with my family, which was huge because, you know, my family didn't understand the ECMO, they didn't understand the central mag. I mean, it looks, yeah, the patient looks very scary when you walk in, in there. Their chest isn't moving because their lungs are shut off. So, um, from that standpoint, um, someone had mentioned the, um, the chaplain help and um, you know there were therapists involved so it was it, it's a big deal for the family um, and the patient um, and so I stayed in that coma like I said for about two and a half months miraculously began showing signs of improvement and um, I was then implanted with an LVAD which is a left ventricular assist device to replace the Centromag. So the LVAD was what I would be able to go home with um, instead of having to be in the hospital because you can't go home with the Centromag. <laughs> so they implanted the LVAD and um, uh, my heart started showing, it was still weak, but it started, at some point the beating started and the LVAD just helped to assist it. and. Um, so I was on that and then slowly weaning off life support took about another month, um, yeah, month, month and a half. And I slowly moved my way up the ranks <laughs> in the hospital floors, um, showing signs of recovery and eventually did my two weeks in uh, physical uh, rehab. Now, the recovery um, was intense. I mean, clearly, <laughs> I was bedridden for, you know, three and a half, no, four months I was bedridden. So uh, two weeks of physical therapy isn't enough. But the recovery was excruciating. It was very, very hard. It was hard to go home and it held that. But after five years, I went home for about four and a half years, and the LVAD allowed me to regain my strength Believe it or not, I actually used to go to yoga with my LVAD. Um, and I got back in shape in time for me to be listed for a heart transplant. And then in 2014, I had my heart transplant. Um, and I was actually put on the ECMO once again after the heart transplant. That's a whole other story. But the ECMO has saved my life twice. and. Um, but the last part I really want to just share that's really important um, is a couple of things. Um, I went back and I asked Dr. X, the original doctor, and I asked him, I, I'm, I'm confused. I don't, really don't understand how I'm still alive. You know, you hear all the time somebody has cardiac arrest. And, well, why was my life spared? And, and, why did this other hospital come up and get me? Why did so many doctors work to save my life? Like, it's really mind-blowing. And he said to me that he just knew he could bring me back. I said, really? But, like, no one else, no one else in that emergency room wanted to continue with CPR. And he said, I, I just knew I could bring you back. And so, for me, it's really important to understand, like, the, that patient doctor advocacy in that room. Like, I would not be sitting here today if it wasn't for that one doctor that was just like, I don't know, I think we can bring her back. I'm not a doctor, so I don't, I don't even know what goes into making that decision. Um, 
But what I do know is that this doctor took a chance, and for whatever reason, he took that chance on me, and I'm still here, and I'm not brain dead. You know, and I, I've been on national TV, I've been sharing my story, I, I do a lot in the tech field. It, it's almost as if none of that ever happened. So, you know, just imagine how many other patients maybe say number one if CPR was extended for over 20 minutes, like for me, 90 minutes or more. Um, and number two, if they were placed on ECMO. And number three, like I was, I was, maybe that hospital couldn't save me, but I was sent to a hospital with the top cardiothoracic care. So it's, it's one of my missions to just share my story with all different types of people, patients, but mostly doctors and medical staff, so that you guys can see, like, you saw all the data today on the PowerPoint presentations, but here, I'm like the living proof of everything you've been talking about today, and that's why you do what you're doing. Because by saving my life, I get to save that much more by promoting ECMO, by promoting extended CPR, and promoting organ transplant, and the LMAT. <laughs> so, um, so thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. That really sort of sums up um, a lot of what we're trying to do. Um, and it's just amazing to see someone survive like that. And you just have to wonder how many more people we could have today uh, that we don't, and, and where this field will go to in the future. So it uh, looks like I'm up for the next presentation. Um, perfect. What I wanted to talk about is, uh, you know, I, I became interested in, in cardiac arrest uh, when I was a medical student. And, and the reason I got interested in it, and this is an important story, is that I came across somebody that I got to know on a personal level very well. It wasn't someone I knew before, but a, a patient that I met, who unfortunately and unexpectedly suffered a cardiac arrest 30 minutes after I'd spoken to them. And I remember watching this whole thing for over an hour where people did try uh, to save this person, and it, it was not successful. And I remember thinking in that room, it was clear that at some point he had flatlined, at some point he had clearly died, even people were trying. And I remember thinking to myself at that time, what, what happened to him? What happened to his, his thinking, conscious being that was with us a few minutes, you know, half an hour ago? And when did he really die? And was he able to see us? Did he, was he able to hear us? People have talked about watching cardiac arrest and recording these experiences. And I just was, was thinking about all these things. Now, this is what happens when you're young. Maybe you, I think you will have to be young at some point, which is a good thing, and some point you'll be older. Because I was in my early 20s, at that moment, in the middle of this chaos of the cardiac arrest, I made a decision that I'm going to study this phenomenon. It's a question to me, and when I graduate medical school, I am going to follow this, and I'm going to study this. But I was naive. I thought, oh, this would be like a one-year project. I'll just get it done on the side of my residency, and then I'll answer this question, you know? So of course, I came back, and I started my research in this area. Uh, here I am, 20-something years later, of course. Things are always much more complicated. But there have been enormous advances. But the one thing that go, we still talk about and I think about is what happens to that person, that conscious human being that was there? What happened to their mind and consciousness when they've gone through this early stage of death? And as Stefano was mentioning, you know, in this experiment, here we are now, 20 something years later, this incredible experiment was done at Yale, and showing that they were able to restore electricity in the brain and different aspects of brain activity. And in fairness, you know, they, they did this for a number of hours, but could consciousness have come back? And what happens if we continue this kind of work? We need to include the study of consciousness into the biological processes that we study. So just to address what we've been talking about today, which is that no matter why people die, whether it's heart attacks, strokes, all the medical stuff that we do ultimately, that may, we try to save people's lives, anything that you can think of, ultimately it's like different sides of the pyramid. What happens when people die is that there's not enough oxygen getting to their vital organs. When that impacts the heart, the heart stops, a person becomes lifeless, motionless, and would otherwise be irreversibly dead. There is no more life process when your heart stops. And so for millennia, we've had this perception that there is a moment when you die, and that's where this comes from. 
We happen to now call it cardiac arrest because we've discovered CPR, so we can't tell people that you were dead and we're bringing you back, so we call it cardiac arrest while we're intervening. The moment we stop, we declare somebody dead. If somebody did not want to be resuscitated, the moment their heart stops is the time of death that we give. So if that happened to me right now, my time of death would be around 3.45. So there is a time, it's a legal document that we provide to patients as well. And as you've seen now, we completely understand that cells don't die immediately, so we've ended up into this gray zone where essentially someone's dead, but they could still be brought back again. And you'll see, even it's a challenge for doctors to talk about this, you know, you'll see editorials, things like, is this person mostly dead or all dead, and how, what, what do we do with this new phenomenon? We don't really know. Uh, Lance Becker touched on this, and that I think that the media picked up on this earlier than, than we have. I think we tend to be quite conservative, and that's good, but sometimes you, know, you have to call it what it is is that really these people are biologically going beyond the threshold of death and they're being brought back again, and no matter what we decide to call it, I think it is true. So the way I think about it a lot is, is like analogous to aviation. You know, if you think about 150 years ago, if we had said to people that you know, it would be possible to fly, they would have thought it was completely crazy. It is not possible to overcome gravity and fly in any meaningful way. And of course, you've seen all those experiments where people created wings and they all fell in the river and it didn't work. And then, in the early 20th century, 1904, the Wright brothers, of course, put together this little contraption, and I call it that, you know, sort of a wooden thing with, you know, whatever you want to call that. And they were able to overcome gravity for, I believe, 27 seconds, at a very, very limited amount, and they didn't fly very high. Clearly, you'd be forgiven if you were witnessing that to be like, okay, so who cares? Like, I'm not going to be able to fly from North Carolina to New York on that. Does it really make any difference? I mean, cares really about this. And what we then see is that through enormous effort and funding and um, discovery, people were able to essentially fast forward this process such that within a couple of decades, you could fly from different parts. And unfortunately, these equipment were used for war. But again, within sort of 50, 60 years, actually human beings went to the moon. So the point I want to make is that in resuscitation science, this is where we are. We're at the point of the Wright brothers. We're not saying that we can bring people back who've been dead for hours. But the point is that there is, there is this inflection where there are enormous possibilities in the future. So going back to my original question now, hearing these incredible presentations, these incredible discussions of things that are going on, and going back to that room in the emergency room uh, in 1994 where I was standing, the same questions still apply. We see that um, CPR, although it is limited, uh, but nonetheless, as a result of that, millions of people have come back to life all over the world. And many of them have reported having conscious thought processes, and sometimes describing watching doctors and nurses working on them, and providing incredible details, like pulling and conversations that were being had. Also, when they've come, they've come back, uh, they've described feeling very peaceful, they've described an experience of um, going through a tunnel towards a light, and during that phase, they described reviewing themselves, reviewing their lives, but with a focus on their humanity. They've described, for example, um, remembering all the things that they've done to other people, and if they've caused pain to others, re-experiencing that pain from the other person's perspective, and therefore judging themselves as human beings through that process. And then eventually they come back. Now this is in stark contrast. So you have this, which is reported by 10 to 20% of people who come back. And it's in stark contrast to what others have reported, which include things like post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, um, memory deficits. So we have these sort of two, two psychological outcomes from cardiac arrest. We've talked about you know, brain outcomes and survival. What, what about the mind? And how do these fit together? So this is an area that I've been fascinated and we've been studying. And also it's been described in small children. So to go back to this, you know, CPR was discovered in 1960. We started having more and more people coming back to life who would otherwise have died. And a, an American medical student with a philosophy background called Raymond Moody noted about 150 cases of people who'd been near death, as he called it at that time, who had these interesting and consistent experiences. He published his <coughs> book, uh, reactions to this from the scientific community were somewhat negative. They thought these are probably just fabricated cases, maybe they're hallucinating, maybe they're lying, it couldn't possibly be right. Um, and that's the challenge we have where medicine starts to interface with philosophy or religion. It's like, it, it creates these challenges. But after that, there were cases described from all over the world, including you know, Japan, China, India, 
Uh, and it became very clear that people are all describing essentially the same thing. They might interpret it based upon their own background. So if somebody happens to be in India and happens to be of a Hindu background, and they see a light, and they describe seeing a being that is full of love and compassion in that light, they may say that I saw one of the Hindu deities, maybe Krishna, I'm not too familiar. And if it happens to be someone in the United States who is a Christian, they may say that in that light, I think I saw Jesus. But actually, they're really describing seeing a light with a being that's being very kind to them, and they're interpreting it in their own way. But the rest of the features are consistent. When I first started out in this, um, people found out I was interested, and I got hundreds of cases being sent to me. Um, and I started studying them. And I was really struck by what people had to tell me. And it's important as doctors to listen to what people say. It's very easy to be dismissive. But when you really listen, you realize there is something fascinating going on. This included you know, a 78-year-old lady who came with her twin sister and who had an experience in the 1930s, I think, or 40s, and she never told anyone about it. And for the first time, she told her twin sister in front of me about this experience because they're afraid of us making fun of them. They're afraid of being ridiculed, right? Uh, but it is quite consistent. And then, even more interestingly, I had a case with a child uh, who had been less than three years old when he had a cardiac arrest. He had a seizure, caused his heart to stop, and apparently lasted about 30 minutes. The ambulance crews came, and they eventually got him back. And apparently during this trip, the, the belt in the ambulance had come undone, and he eventually went to hospital and came back. And his grandmother noticed that he kept on drawing the same thing, which I'm showing you here, uh, as you see in that picture up there. And then he started talking about this through the course of play and said, oh, your grandma, when I died, I saw a lamp. So they were shocked. Like, why would this child think that he's died? Nobody told them. And eventually, they noticed he kept on drawing the same thing that you see here. So if you look at that picture at the top, he started explaining through the course of play, of course, a small child, that when he had died, he'd seen that lamp. So that round thing is the lamp that he described, uh, that he had seen, and that you're connected to it by a cord, uh, which is the line that he had drawn. Uh, with himself laying there. Now, I had heard from many adults the same thing, that they felt they were connected by a cord when they were in that death state, and of course, that they seen a light. But it was amazing for a small child to do that. A couple of years later, I managed to go and interview him. He was then six years old, and he drew this picture of himself uh, as he'd been watching his resuscitation, as you'll see there. And he described in accurate detail events that had gone on, uh, which had been verified apparently by the ambulance crews later on. You'll note that, I don't know why, and unfortunately the son is uh, not very happy over there, maybe because it was that he has a cardiac arrest, but that's what he drew. If you can see the date, that's 1999, so 20 years ago when I went and met him. And this is him, his name was also Sam, with his grandmother who wrote to me about this experience. So these cases are out there and they're fascinating. When we look back historically, you see that these have been described throughout time. Uh, apparently there's a reference in Plato's Republic to a soldier who died and had a, uh, had a near fatal injury and had this experience. Um, and here's a painting by Hieronymus Bosch, a 15th, 16th century Dutch painter who's drawn essentially people going towards a light through a tunnel. Again, this is not consistent with sort of Christian ideas about death uh, at the time that he was living, so we don't know whether, you know, how he knew about this or why he'd drawn this, but people now tell us that's what they had seen. When I started my interest in this area, really if that happened to me today, I would not have been doing this work. That's what happens 20 years later, but I'm glad I didn't. And I'm glad I did do that work. The sort of scientific explanations were this is probably some sort of physiological effect. You know, people who are dying clearly having chemical derangements in the brain. This must be a simple effect of a lack of oxygen, causing them to have a perception that their brain is shutting down. They're seeing this tunnel as the occipital lobe sort of shuts down gradually. But it didn't make sense. You know, we saw people who had low oxygen levels all the time, even as a student at that time, and of course now in my professional period, and nobody starts talking about seeing a tunnel as their oxygen levels go down. Um, other you know, explanations have been that this is probably like taking a psychedelic drug, you're having a trip, you're sort of imagining things. But again, patients are describing watching accurate events. You know, I had a colleague of mine, a cardiologist, who told me, one day pulled me aside and said, look, I have to tell you about an event that occurred to me that I've never told anyone, it's completely freaked me out, and I'm never going to talk about it again. But since you're interested, I will tell you. And I'll summarize very quickly, but he told me how he was in charge of a cardiac arrest of a 32-year-old man whose heart had stopped. They tried for about 45 minutes to get him back. They gave up because they had no chance. He was blue, his heart was flatlined. And then he left this patient to go and write the medical notes for about 15 minutes. He goes back in the room to check how much adrenaline they had given. This was in England. And um, he was talking to the head nurse. And then he said, I looked at this patient, and I suddenly realized he's not quite as blue as when I'd left him. So he said, oh, 
I looked again and we looked at each other and we said, this doesn't make any sense. So reluctantly, I put my hand in his groin to feel for his pulse and he had a pulse again. So we called the cardiac rest team back again. Now this is 15 minutes with no blood flow, no CPR, nothing. So we're like, what the hell do we do with this? We don't even know what to do with this. But he's definitely going to be brain dead, that's for sure. He's had 45 minutes and another 15 minutes. Sent him to the ICU. He comes back to his regular job. A week or two later, he says I was on the on rounds. This young man waves at me. I go over to him and says, oh, do you remember me? And I said, no, I'm sorry, I don't remember. And he said, oh, I'm the guy that you saved. And then he proceeds to tell him all the details of the events that were going on in the room, conversations, the look on his face. And of course, you can imagine, Richard was completely freaked out. He's like, I, I don't even think about this. And, and the reality is I've seen many colleagues who have gone through this. So it's something we can't quite explain, but it is fascinating. Other explanations were that maybe it's a psychological phenomenon. People who think they're about to die start imagining something comfortable. But you know, again, people who have cardiac arrest, as Cherie said, your heart suddenly stops. You haven't got time to start imagining some sort of fantasy around your death. I found these other explanations. Uh, thankfully, there's no data to support them. But that maybe when you go to the operating room, some evil doctors are shining a light on your eyes. Uh, and then six months later, you show up on a uh, TV talk show talking about how you suddenly saw this bright light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. The point I want to make is that in terms of those theories that have been put forward, there has been no data to support them scientifically as to how they can cause these experiences. And some of the work that's been done really relates to um, a lack of or inconsistent research scales that leads to um, sometimes inaccurate reporting. So here's a study that was carried out, uh, published in, uh, I believe in Science or Nature, one of the top, top journals, uh, where essentially researchers took a person put them on a chair, and then put a camera behind this person and had the camera recording the back for a couple of hours and had the person put goggles on so they could only see their back. Okay, so what the camera was shooting from their back. After a while, their brain got used to that sort of view and they started to think that they're looking at, them at their own back. And then the researchers essentially took a hammer and attacked the camera. And what happened, the person startled, right? And they said, oh, here, we've re reproduced the so-called out-of-body experience because this person thought that they weren't in their own body at the time. It's completely different to what Richard Mansfield is talking about or others have told us about. And I think that the other point here is that, you know, it might be that there are experiences that seem to have some similarities, but really the, the devil is in the detail. When you study what people have to say, it is really quite different. And the other point that people have made I mentioned is that these might be like taking LSD or the other psychedelic drugs. Again, people say that, but when you look at the details and what people describe in these circumstances, they're actually quite, quite different. And the challenge is that the research scales being used to label people are not consistent, not accurate enough. So you're mistakenly label people with something that they haven't really had. But the key point I want to address here is that this is an important factor, is that everything that we experience, of course, is modulated through some process in the brain. You know, let's take love as an example. Everyone here has experienced love, and you can study the transmitters in the brain, dopamine, oxytocin, prolactin, and many, many others. But identifying the neural intermediary of any experience doesn't tell us whether the experiences are real or not. We actually determine reality simply based on society and social norms. So if everyone here had had a cardiac arrest survive and had an experience like that, we would all be like, of course it happened, of course it's real, we've all had it. Because we've all had love, we think it's real. Because this doesn't happen to us and people don't talk about it as much, sometimes we accept it, sometimes we don't. But the reality simply is that we cannot determine the reality of anyone's inner experience through any neurological marker that we may find. But there is an effect of having this cardiac arrest, having these experiences, people come back, if they review their lives, if they experience this being of light, they come back and they're transformed very positively. They become much, much less afraid of death, they become much more altruistic, they have a deeper meaning and purpose to life. They engage more with society. They more engage with their family. They take a deeper value to essentially what is humanity, taking care of other people and being less self-centered. So it's, it's amazing what it does to them long term. And this was shown by a study also by Pim van Lommel, a Dutch cardiologist published in The Lancet in 2001, where he followed people for eight years who had a cardiac arrest, who had an experience, and those who did not have it. And he showed that those who did have an experience had a much stronger transformative change compared to those who did not have any of these experiences. One of the key questions that had been coming up since we started this sort of work was, well, actually, when is the experience really happening? Is it happening maybe before the heart stops, right, where the brain is still working? Or is it happening in the period where the heart is not beating? 
and the brain is not supposed to be functioning? Or is it happening after the brain has recovered and people think it happened when they were in a true cardiac arrest? Um, after many years of trying and, and doing preliminary work and getting funding, we put together this, the largest study ever of cardiac arrest patients looking at their experiences, their mind and consciousness, the so-called the AWARE study, Awareness During Resuscitation. Uh, it was carried out across uh, 15 uh, major medical centers with over 30 or 33 investigators in total. And uh, we tried to understand this. We looked at 2,060 cardiac arrest patients, and we tried to put images or sounds in the room, we thought, that we would try to see when this experience was occurring. We also wanted to find out really if people are conscious, could they really be conscious? Because again, from my perspective, this should not be happening. According to our models, there should be no consciousness at that time. Unfortunately, as you see here, the reality of cardiac arrest is a lot of work to be done, that 85% of these people did not survive, so it's hard to interview them and to talk to them. Of those who did survive, many of them were not well enough to be interviewed. They had to taken care of, and unfortunately we could not do that. So just over 100 people were able to be interviewed. And what we found, I can't explain, but it was fascinating, and we checked and it was consistent across all of our sites, that although 60% of people reported having had no sense of awareness of, of their cardiac arrest, that 40% of them actually did feel that they had maybe been aware, but they weren't able to recall information. They couldn't recall specific details. About 10% of them had these classical sort of near-death type experiences that were transformative and we've been changing them. And two people actually had a so-called out-of-body experience where they described in detail what was happening to them. Um, but they happened in areas where we didn't have any pictures. But one of them uh, was able to accurately recall uh, conversations and events and also the timing of the AED device, the device that gives uh, defibrillation, because it had, had mentioned how many times to give shocks. And this was recorded in the medical notes and corresponded with about three to five minutes uh, of the period after their cardiac arrest. So it raises this bigger question, which I think is affecting you know, Dr. Sestan and others, is what happens to the mind when your heart stops? What happens when you've gone through that early stage of death, that gray zone that is still reversible? Um, and how does it relate to brain activity? Because at best, this is a severely disordered brain, which normally shouldn't sustain that level of consciousness. And at worst, the period is not working at all. So we concluded that while it was not possible to absolutely prove the reality or meaning of patients' experiences and claims of awareness due to the very low incidence of explicit recall and visual awareness, it was impossible also to disclaim them either. And more work is needed in this area. And, and what we concluded as a group of investigators is that clearly the recalled experience surrounding death now merits further genuine investigation without prejudice. And it really touches on a fundamental question, really, that, and I have to be honest, you know, I come at this from a medical perspective, but a lot of people in the audience and otherwise are interested from a different perspective. You know, death doesn't just belong to doctors. It's been discussed forever. And one of the key groups that discuss it, of course, are philosophers. You know, what happens to your mind? What happens to consciousness? How do they work together? And no one's been able to explain it very well. And the issue, is the issue here is the following. If you look at a person's brain, we're all conscious thinking beings sitting in this room right now. But if you look at a whole brain, it's impossible to find an area where consciousness comes from. In other words, there's no brain process that accounts for how your thoughts come to be. We know the intermediaries that modulate it, but there's no mechanism to account for how thoughts or conscious awareness, the subjective sense of self, comes to be. And if you break the brain down further into the different tracks, even single cells, there's no mechanism that's been put forward that could account for that. However, when you look at the literature, the, the, the opinions are all over the place. There are some people who say, well, we don't know what it is, but it has to arise from networks of brain cells, even though we don't have evidence for it. There are others who say that maybe you should think of consciousness, that entity that is us, as we do with other things, like in physics, like with mass or gravity, as something that cannot be reduced down to anything more simple. Then there are others who suggest that, well, maybe you know, it's not actually the brain cells themselves, because there are organisms, of course, that don't have neurons, you know, amoeba or other simple organisms that actually don't have any brain cells. Are we to say that they're not conscious? And maybe it's not that, but it's the microtubules, these little sort of uh, scaffolding structures inside brain cells that may be origin the source or the origin of consciousness. Again, others would say, well, that doesn't tell us how it could arise. It's just saying it could be somewhere else. And the other challenge, of course, with this notion that people have raised uh, of consciousness simply arising from your brain is that it would challenge a lot of our fundamental views about your accountability. Because if who I am and what I am is simply a product of my brain cell activity, 
then I should not be um, accountable if I do something to somebody else. If I hurt my neighbor, you shouldn't be blaming me for it because it was my brain cells that did it. And of course, our justice system doesn't work that way. So just to bear that in mind. And there are others who propose that maybe the mind or consciousness should be thought of as a separate entity to the brain. And that maybe even, which I like, is maybe it is a type of matter, but it's more subtle than we can measure today. We haven't got the tools, like electromagnetic phenomena, that we can't simply measure, but they carry sound and picture. And maybe the brain is acting as an intermediary, and your consciousness is a different entity that we haven't yet discovered. So before I end, I have just a couple of minutes. I want to explain, you know, what does it feel like from the person's perspective who, who's gone through cardiac arrest and who's then had this review of their lives? And what might it be like for all of us when we go through that? Here's a person, and here's what they said. I found there was a being beside me. It was a comforting presence, a reassuring presence, but was also a presence of magnitude and power. Then I began a review of my life, of the key moments of my life. But at the same time, I was re-experiencing it from other people's points of view. And that was a stunner, because you feel their pain, you feel the sting, you feel the hurt. So what I saw was my own lies and my own self-deception to myself, which I had used to convince me that doing certain things was okay, because people have deserved it. Then, I was now experiencing the emotional impact it had on the other people. I felt their pain, I felt the shock of I felt like I was a failure as a person, and I wasn't the person I thought I was. It was humiliating. I felt really dreadful, and it was completely humbling. The judgment came all from myself. It was not from an outside source. But then this being that was with me was also sending me comforting messages. I felt I had a chance now to change things, so that next time I get back for life review, it wouldn't be the same. Or at least they would say he tried. This is just a snippet of the cases that we've been studying. It's very hard for me to sort of say, well, someone reviewing their lives is simply a hallucination, they're just imagining it, or it's a delusional experience. You know? We wouldn't say that if we had that experience. And the thing I want to say is simply that these are very powerful experiences. You need to look at someone in the eye who survived and who's telling you what they remember from. Clearly, what we're hearing today is that there's a lot more work to be done, and we've opened up a new frontier. But since everyone wants to have simple answers, um, I do want to leave you with one definite fact of life. And this is what you should definitely know. So if you happen to find yourself in this particular situation, here's the answer. If you're in the hospital, and you suddenly find yourself this tall, and you can see yourself on the operating table, you will know at that point that you weren't here. <laughs> what happens after that, I cannot tell you. But let me just warn you what it's going to feel like, OK? So with that, I'm going to finish my talk. And I hope this has been helpful to you. We've talked about consciousness, and one of the key things that I find very interesting is the fact that you could potentially, aside from what happens during that period, but you could maybe take someone who has ended up with a disorder of consciousness, let's say a vegetative state, and think about, can we do something to bring this person back again? Again, we think of these things as being finite, but it's important to challenge our perceptions. So I'm asking um, one of my uh, former colleagues, Dr. Peter Forgat, who is an assistant professor at the Wild Cornell, um, School of Medicine um, in the Department of Neurology to come and talk a little bit about uh, his work in looking at the recovery from consciousness and that our perceptions that recovery is not possible may need to be challenged and also tell us about some early work that his lab had been doing with Dr. Nico Schiff in trying to find ways to maybe even modulate this and, and bring people back uh, after it's been perceived as being too late. Hi everyone, thanks for the, the nice uh, introduction, Sam. And uh, I've known Sam since I was an intern in, at Cornell and he was one of the fellows in the intensive care. And he was the only intensivist who was so kind and gentle that when he rejected our transfer request to the intensive care, I came out more satisfied after our dis discussions than frustrated, which is not always the case. If anybody has been an intern, probably can uh, understand what I mean by that. Um, Is there a pointer here? Uh, that's all right. So what's great? 
Sam um, asked me to do, the, uh, to do the today and uh, to talk about it, sort of our experiences in, in patients who are in so-called disorder of consciousness. So those are patients who had some severe brain injury for any reason, either from a trauma, from a car accident, or from cardiac arrest, or any other reasons. And then when they are recovering, sort of they stuck in these in-between states. We are not fully conscious, but we uh, don't really uh, understand their level of consciousness. And sort of. Uh, elude some of the ideas and some of the concepts that we are developed in these patients how, and how that can be related to cardiac arrest and the uh, patients who are recovering after cardiac arrest. So these are my disclosures. Uh, so I'm going to start with a case presentation. I'm going to present a couple of cases uh, during my talk and uh, sort of just to uh, demonstrate the magnitude of the problem what we are heading, uh, what we are facing here today. So this patient had a skateboarding accident. Uh, that he was 19 years old and he fell backwards, he didn't have a, a helmet on, and it was very severe brain injury, a lot of bleeding in the in the brain, CT showed subarachnoid hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage, intraventricular hemorrhage, so these are all signs of very severe brain injury. And he was in the hospital for several weeks, two months, and at the end of the end of the hospitalization, he was diagnosed being in the vegetative state, state which means that he was not able to move any of his extremities, he was called quadriplegic. His eyes were closed, he was not able to open his eyes, and he was inable, unable to speak or vocalize or give any response to the environment. And he remained in this state in a nursing home uh, for four years. And uh, in the nursing home, four years being in this state, his therapist, just by chance, discovered that if, he, if she or he has up his hand, uh, he's sort of able to control the all of his, all of his hand and respond to questions using that method, using that method, that the hand would fall either to the nose or to the belly. We had the privilege to admit him to our research unit and to see if, you know, what's going on with this patient. And we were sort of suspicious, like, is this real? Is this not? It sounds uh, quite extreme. So there he is. Stop the video. So what the question was, if you didn't hear, is you know, uh, belly for yes, head for no. For yes, head for no. Are you in the hospital or are you in a bathtub? And what I want to point out also that the person who's holding the hand has a a, a mask on and also a noise canceling headphone, so the person doesn't have any knowledge about the question or the nature of the question because there could be some some conscious. You know, direction with the hand, so the person who's holding the hand has no knowledge of this question. So, what you saw is that simple command following, just to tell him, touch your nose or touch your belly, he was 100% accurate using this method. So, they developed uh, uh, some questions about his life, some autobiographical questions. You know, are you 10 years old? Are you uh, 23, year, 23 years old? Logical questions. Do you put on your sock before your shoe? Do you put on your shoe before? your sock and orientation questions, are you in the hospital, are you in the shopping mall? And using these questions, we tested him in during multiple sessions using this yes-no method. And he was accurate 60% of the autobiographical questions, 70% of the logical questions, and 50% of the orientation questions. So this is sort of telling us that this is all of these are way above chance. So he is able to answer to these, but what is exactly his level of consciousness? What is his memory? of all of these is sort of unclear. So what is exactly consciousness? So being from Cornell, I'm bringing, bringing the heritage of Plumet Posner, uh, who's sort of the grandfather of consciousness and researching consciousness. And this is their uh, book uh, called The Diagnosis and Treatment of Super of Coma. This is now the fifth edition of COVID just came out of this year. And this is the way uh, they are defining consciousness. So we heard a lot of uh, different approaches, how we can uh, approach consciousness from philosophy or from, uh, from other ways, but medically, consciousness is defined as the state of full awareness of self and relationship to the environment. So are we aware of ourselves and are we aware of what's happening around us? And clinically, the level of consciousness, when we speak about these uh, states of disorders of consciousness, are defined operationally at the bedside by uh, examining the responses of the patient to, the, uh, uh, to our uh, questions, to the examiner. 
So this is uh, still the gold standard. The gold standard to diagnose is called the coma recovery scale. It's a clinical scale, and it's, it, there are questions which sort of says, you know, am I pointing to the ceiling? Am I pointing to the ground? You know, look to the red ball uh, and look to the blue, blue ball, or just follow a picture with your eyes and uh, fix it on, uh, and try to see if the patient can fix it and follow it. So these are the disorders of consciousness, the way uh, they are defined. So, so, so coma is uh, also called an unarousable unresponsiveness. In this state, the patient's eyes are closed, and there's no uh, eye opening or seemingly sleep, sleep wake cycle, there's no command following, there's no communication with this uh, in this state. Patients don't stay in coma uh, for a long time. They usually, after a couple of weeks for being in coma, they start to open their eyes and they enter the so-called so vegetative state. So in the vegetative state, the only difference between two coma is that the eyes are open intermittently. So for a couple of hours, the eyes are open, then it's closed. So it's seemingly just by observing the patient, it seems like that the patient is, has sleep fix cycles. But for any of these questions, any of the examiner, there are no responses that would tell us that there is any understanding of the, of the environment. And then there's a min, the minimally conscious state, when the eyes are open intermittently, uh, and uh, if we ask the patients to follow commands to do this uh, or to, to do something else, the patient sometimes is responding, but sometimes not. So it's, it's not consistent. It's re reproducible, it's there, but it's not consistent enough. And it's especially not consistent to use it as a communication channel, with the, uh, to use it as a communication method with the patient. Just uh, for clarification, what's not part of disorder of, consci of consciousness is a uh, brain death and locked in state. So brain death is a, the total cessation, as we heard earlier, of, of all brain function, including the brain stem, and by legal definition, that's equivalent of death. And locked in state is a special injury to uh, a part of the brain, which is called the, the pons, which sort of uh, destroys all the, the pathways of motor pathways going out from, out from the brain to the spinal cord, and the patient is not able to move. However, the eye movement centers in the brain are above that level, so the patient can move his eyes uh, freely and can uh, blink freely, and the rest of the brain is intact. So by definition, that patient is fully conscious. These patients can, using eye movements and blinks, can write books. This is a, one of the one famous cases from a, a French uh, a patient who wrote a book called The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, and also there was a movie made from this. So sort of to, to get into the concepts and understand when we speak, speak about this, I, I like to use this uh, 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 cartoon. So what you see here, that the disorders of consciousness are here in the left lower corner. So this is the vegetative state, this is coma, this is minimally conscious state. And then this is the, uh, the, y, the x axis uh, uh, the cognitive function of the patient from total cognitive loss, loss to normal, and then this is the, the motor function from total motor loss to normal motor function. And I want to highlight these two lines here. So this line is uh, the consistent uh, co-directed function of movement. If you, if you imagine uh, examining a patient uh, in front of you, if there is no movement, uh, then there's just no way to tell uh, what's the level of consciousness of that, of that person. So every response requires some kind of movement. So if the patient is not able to do the movement, uh, use the, uh, the move, uh, then sort of where is in bit here uh, under this line, is it the level of, of cognitive function? This is sort of impossible to tell at the bedside. Once there are movements which are reproducible, that's a communication channel right away. So if somebody can consistently even just the flicker of the thumb can signal one way or the other one, there's a yes no communication channel and we can build on that and use in computer interfaces or, or letter boards that can be used for communication and to assess the level of consciousness and the cognitive functions of those, those patients. So really the, the one uh, uh, problem and one question I want to concentrate on is this gray box, which is also uh, uh, called as cognitive motor dissociation. So there's a, a possible dissociation between the, the level of cognitive functions and motor functions in these patients. And that can range all the way from the minimally conscious state to it's a, uh, called the complete locked in state. So as opposed to the regular lock, locked in state, these patients are not able to move their eyes and not able to blink either. But it's just at the bedside, we cannot tell what's uh, the level of cognition up there. And the other, problem, the other set of questions is that some patients who are in coma or in vegetative state, with time, 
can improve even spontaneously. And uh, traditionally, what we understood, what we understood a severe brain injury after a traumatic brain injury, after a year, there's not much chance for further improvement. And after cardiac arrest, maybe after three months, there's not much chance for further improvement. But yet, there are a lot of patients now which we, can, we describe and we see who are getting better and emerging from minimally, con minimally conscious state even years, sometimes even decade, decades after the brain injury and able to start communicating, able to start speaking and recovering fur further. And what's the mechanism of this? How is this happening? Is really, really not understood well and not clear. So let's start with the, the cognitive motor dissociation. So really the, the landmark paper uh, showing this was in 2006, uh, uh, published in Science. And uh, it was a single case report using fMRI. So fMRI, for those who don't know what it is, it's, it's an it's a MRI technique and sort of measuring, measuring the blood flow within the brain. And if the brain area is active, then there, the, that part of the brain is using more blood and using more oxygen. So by measuring the oxygen level, uh, we can approximate that that brain area is active. And here, this patient was asked to imagine playing tennis. And as you see, the activity is almost identical to a healthy volunteer to control. And also was asked to just uh, walk around his home, entering rooms and going all around. And as you see, the, the brain activity is almost identical compared to a healthy uh, person. And this patient was in, in vegetative state, so appeared to be totally unconscious at the bedside. So that was uh, a very important. There was a follow-up study by Martin Monti a couple of years later, a series of patients, 26 patients, uh, and uh, about 50% of them was able to do motor imagery. But uh, there was one patient who was able to use motor imagery as a communication method also. So it, uh, it says, is your father's name Alexander? If yes, then imagine playing tennis. If no, then don't imagine playing tennis. And they're able to use that kind of method accurately to communicate. Uh, obviously, it's you know, getting an fMRI takes a long time, so it's not the ideal way to use for communication. So is this a possibility uh, in the setting of cardiac arrest? So we described a patient uh, after cardiac arrest who was 16 years old, was playing sport, collapsed, had very prolonged cardiac arrest, uh, uh, prolonged CPR for 45 minutes, uh, got hypothermia, and uh, got a pacemaker afterwards. And we were able to see her and admit her two and a half years after this cardiac arrest. At that point, uh, she was alert. She was uh, laughing at times. It seemed like in, there were some emotional responses to the environment, but otherwise was not able to communicate, not able to follow commands. And based on the, the, the clinical scale, uh, his, her state was consistent with vegetative state. We couldn't use uh, MRI or fMRI in her case because of the pacemaker, that's a contraindication for MRI. So we developed a technology to use EEG, so using the brain waves and sort of uh, picking up the signal following a command of uh, using similar kind of motor imagery, tennis playing or swimming or navigation, and contrast the signal within the EEG to the, the time periods when the command is stop imagining doing that. And by contrasting these two signals, we can uh, uh, pick up uh, signals, signals of you know changes in brain activity in relation to the to the actual command. So this is this is her. So this is before the command period, and this is contrasting the signals uh, uh, after the, the the command. So the command the command is keep opening and closing your right hand, and stop opening and closing your your right hand. And we see significant difference over the left part of the brain during the response period, which is a little bit variable but consistently present for nine seconds after, after the command. So she's uh, able to do command following using this covert method, using this EEG, uh, even though she's appearing to be vegetative at the bedside. Uh, what's interesting is that, you know, we couldn't get MRI, but we could get a PET. So PET measuring the metabolic activity of the brain. So what's more red here, that means it's, it's more active. And what's dark, it means that the cells are not active there, they are not functioning well. And what's interesting in her case, what you see uh, also here compared to 10 healthy volunteers, that the front of the brain is normal compared to healthy volunteers, and the back of the brain is sort of, this is quantification of what we see here in the picture, picture as well, is sort of gone. So the, uh, it's the same brain, 
getting the same hypoxic hit during the same cardiac arrest, yet the front part of the brain survives normally, and including this spot here, which is the thalamus, which I'm going to talk about. The back part of the brain uh, is, uh, uh, is not, not functioning, it's not there. So is this, uh, so the, all of these were in the chronic state. So is this possible in the ICU? So there are more recent studies, and there are two studies which came out very recently which brought this kind of technology into the ICU. So this was uh, published in 2007 by Brian Adlow in Brain. She was, he was using uh, fMRI, and in eight patients tested in the ICU on average nine days after the uh, severe brain injury, four of them in the vegetative state and one in the conscious state, had uh, command following using fMRI, which is a shocking finding, uh, if you imagine that. And uh, a more recent paper just came out this summer uh, in the New England Journal by Jan Klaassen's group uh, used a similar kind of motor imagery uh, the commands by using a, a, a different kind of method to, to detect the signal that what we use, but we regarding the same command is a large series of 104 patients, so it's a, it's a lot of patients in the ICU, and 16 of them, so 15% of those patients uh, using this kind of method, four days after the brain injury, showed brain activation in relation to these commands. And uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's significant. And what's most important, and what I want to tell, that these, of these 16 patients, eight of them regained consciousness by the end of the, hosp the hospitalization, so 50% of them as opposed to 26% percent, percent, percent of the other patients who didn't have this activation. And seven of them, so 44% of them, a year after uh, uh, the brain injury was uh, independently functioning as opposed to 14% uh, of the rest of the patients. So it's not just the detection of it, which is by itself, we should think about our patients who are in the ICU, or people, doctors who are in the ICU, seeing these patients. Uh, uh, it's not just the detection of, of possibility of conscious awareness, and comment following, but also it relates to the outcome as well of the patient. So let's switch to uh, the mechanisms of emergence from these uh, disorders of consciousness. So this is, uh, we are neurologists, we, write, we like brain localized, uh, the dysfunction of the brain and brain areas and brain circuits. And these are some brain areas which are classically thought to be related to, to uh, coma and recovery of consciousness. So it could be either in the, in the brain stem or in the middle of the brain, uh, in the midbrain, and especially uh, the area which is called the central thalamus, so this uh, is the central part of the thalamus, or in the cortical area. So these are, this is the gray matter uh, area of the brain and widespread areas of these cortical areas, and the connections between uh, uh, the frontal part of the brain and the, the more posterior part of the brain also, the long-range connections are, are connected in between the central columns. So central columns appears to be a point in the brain that which activity, if it's altered, then the level of consciousness uh, can be related to that. So that sort of tells us a few ideas of what can we do for patients to, to allow them to for their recovery of their consciousness. And one option is to stimulate the central columns. So that was done. Uh, uh, in 2007 by, by Dr. Schiff in three patients, a deep brain stimulator, so these are electrodes uh, which are inserted into the central thalamus, uh, was, a, was a, uh, inserted into patients who were in vegetative state and minimally conscious state. And one of these patients, in relation to the stimulation, to the deep brain stimulation, improved, uh, uh, including improvements in vocalization and uh, uh, being able to be fed by mouth as opposed to the, through, the, through a feeding tube. So that's sort of uh, uh, emerging from minimally conscious state, uh, able to vocalize and back when the stimulator is turned off. Another option is automatically stepping forward. Another interesting phenomena is that uh, there's a small subset of patients, a few percent of patients who are in minimally conscious state, and this was just discovered serendipitously, if we give them a medication called Zolpidem, which is normally a sleeping pill, paradoxical that these patients who are in minimally conscious state can emerge from minimally conscious state when they get the sleeping medication. Then one possible mechanism is that Zolpidem in that level is inhibiting the striatum, which are in the middle of the brain, which normally inhibit the central thalamus, but uh, if they are normally 
overactive and they over inhibit, so if it inhibit the functioning of these areas, that releases the, the normal functioning of the central column. So that's one way that this would fit in our uh, concept and model. Another option is to, to stimulate using a weak electric current the, the cortex, especially the frontal area. So this is the this is called the transcranial director in stimulation, and there was a study which was done in minimally conscious patients and thirty patients. It's the weak current and uh, that improved uh, their level of consciousness using the, the coma recovery scale. And another major study that was done, the largest study done in minimally conscious patients using amantadine, uh, which is a do uh, it's a dirty drug. There are many different mechanisms of action, but one of them is dopaminergic. So there's a sort of widespread activation of the striatum and the cortical areas. We using an antigen, and there was a significant difference between the patients who got placebo compared to patients who got a method, you know, or 183 patients. So, um, what? How does that relate to to cardiac arrest and post cardiac arrest coma? So, Dr. Louis, sorry, was uh, very helpful. So, I don't have to go through all of this uh, again in the slides. So, these are sort of the markers we use as clinicians to prognosticate patients who are in coma after cardiac arrest. So, we use. Uh, a clinical exam examination, uh, myoclonus, reaction to pain, pupillary effect, coronary effect. We use all these EEG findings. I'm an EEGer, so if you see uh, what we're looking is into re reactivity. So is there any change in the EEG when we stimulate the patient? All these uh, epileptic form discharges, and especially patients who go into status epilepticus or birth suppression, we already heard about those and we saw images of those. Those are considered to be very malignant findings in the setting in, of post cardiac arrest coma on the EEG. And traditionally, uh, the numbers uh, to predict a bad outcome, if those are present, are, are, are there. So the traditional we think that that, that that patient is not going to have a chance for recovery. And also here is imaging and the biomarkers and somatosensory we will potentially discuss. So the problem is if everything looks pretty bad, then you know, probably the patient is going to, uh, the outcome is not going to be uh, that favorable. But what happens when there is a mixture of these? So the current approach is multimodal approach. So we use all of these to sort of assess the chances for recovery. But what if the patient has normal imaging, but has status epileptic or birth suppression and some other malignant findings? Then we're sort of not exactly sure. Uh, and uh, that's sort of the question is more complicated. So in that case, currently what is also taken into consideration is the length of coma, how long the patient is staying in coma. And generally, the guidelines say that you know the more time goes by and the patient is still not waking up, that the likelihood that the patient is going to wake up eventually is less and less. And uh, the last you know uh, recovery was described as 25 days, but most most people who will recover they will recover within the first week. If they are still in coma after a week, then they, the chances for recovery is minimal. And even if they recover and they improve for the year, they're going to remain in a, in a dependent state and have a poor quality of life afterwards. So we had a patient um, uh, who is home, who I'm gonna uh, wanted to bring in with the postcard This patient, patient with mass uh, collapse in the hotel lobby, had CPR, and uh, uh, Rask, the return of the spontaneous circulation for 20 minutes, had hyperthermia. Hyper so I had all the malignant EEG findings, went into status epilepticus, had birth suppression for about a week. The MRI showed a little bit of, of damage, not very extensive, a full-up MRI was normal. Yet if you look at the, this EEG activity, so this is sort of summarizing longer segments of EEG, uh, looking into the frequency content of the EEG. So when, uh, so this is low frequency, like the brain is working very slow, this is high frequency, the brain is, is, is working much faster. So when this is a straight line like this, it sort of tells us that there is not much activity going on in, in the brain. So what you see here is that uh, at one month after, started to have spontaneous eye opening. So came out from coma uh, to vegetative state. And at two months, started to be able to communicate reliably with nodding yes and no with the, with, with the head, this patient, and moving her extremities. At three months, was able to speak, was alert and oriented, uh, uh, but not, was not able to stand up. And then four months was able to pivot from the bed uh, to the chair and was uh, acute rehab. And the EEG activity, even at two months, was very, very minimal. There was, 
this bump is some activity emerging, and at, at three months, the, the EEG shows much more activity. So the sort of the question is, you know, what is happening to the cells? Why are they not active? Uh, this prolonged time, so it's almost two months, and the cells are, are still not showing much activity, at least not what we can pre uh, pick up at the, uh, at the, at the, with the EEG. So we have two more patients like this. I'm going to quickly just go through the, uh, they are all outliers, uh, recovery of consciousness. Uh, there is more than two months with them, and they had very extreme findings, very prolonged birth suppression, absent reactivity in status atlepticus for 14 months. And for this patient that I mentioned last time, uh, who was in status atlepticus for 14 days, I should say, we had the chance to, uh, re to admit her twice, uh, seven months and 19 months after the cardiac arrest. At seven months, we had uh, the, the cognitive functions using uh, attention tests, vigilance tests, uh, orientation tests, aphasia screening, looking into memory, still very impaired. However, a year later, so seven months to 19 months, all of these are maximized. So that this improvement doesn't stop after a few weeks or a few months. If these patients who are in this state may be in coma for two months, they can continue to recover even one and a half years after the cardiac arrest. So how is this happening is the question of the day, what we are discussing with all of these uh, uh, the, the presentations today. So this is our model of asking the same question. The cells who are here and sort of deciding their fate to go into cell death or, or towards recovery, you know, what, what are the factors that can alter them to go into this way as opposed to this way? How can we intervene? And maybe some of these ideas from disorders of consciousness uh, uh, research can inform research in uh, uh, post-cardiac post 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 arrest of my problem. So I think I summarize all of this during my talks. I'm not going to read again my conclusions. And thank you for the attention. And these are all the people who contributed to this work. Fantastic to, to again see the things that we thought that were impossible, that it may be possible even to treat people who got in the states. I just asked one of my, uh, our colleagues, again, from NYU Langone, uh, uh, Dr. Shari Bosnahan, who works in the intensive care unit with me, to just summarize uh, for us, again, new concepts about maybe it's possible to try to develop other treatments and possibilities for saving the brain, uh, even though we thought it was perhaps impossible in the past. So, Dr. Brosnahan. Okay, so um, I know that we're running a little over. I'll try to go through my slides pretty quickly. Um, So um, I know we've talked a lot about CPR, and as you can see, CPR has a rich, rich history. Um, but however, uh, not much has changed uh, in the since the 1960s in terms of the actual hands on the body that we've done. But what has changed a lot in terms of our understanding of CPR has to do more with what happens after uh, someone is revived from cardiopulmonary. And what we kind of understand at this point is that there's actually two mechanisms of injury. So there's the first uh, type of injury, which we've talked about when uh, the there's actually hypoxia to the brain. And then there's a the second injury that happens when there's inflammation. And I like to think about this in a simplistic way, and it's kind of when you uh, get hit. So when you initially, if you got hit on the arm, you would initially have the time in which you got hit, and that would cause pain. And then maybe the next day you'd notice that your arm hurt and you touched it, and that's from the inflammation that's actually causing the secondary pain. And so if we can do something in order to mitigate that risk of having the inflammation, that's actually what would cause that long-term pain that we're having. And if it occurs in the brain, ultimately problems in the brain. So if the brain cells don't actually die within minutes, when do they die and how do they die? And we've had a lot of slides that have talked about this, and since we are um, a, a little short on time, I will not uh, hit it again. However, uh, the important things are to know that not just oxygen depletion, but actually things that happen on the cellular level uh, occur with hypoxia. And that when the person uh, is, has uh, is reperfused, 
that actually sets off inflammation and other cellular mechanisms, cascades, which we could possibly target in order to mitigate these risks. So uh, Sam talked about how the ischemic event might be similar to a, uh, uh, a earthquake and that the reperfusion event is actually the tsunami that results over it. And if we can't stop the earthquake from happening, perhaps we can stop the tsunami from occurring or at least mitigate the tsunami. And this is not a new concept, however it is a concept that we're working on. And we can see that papers going back to the 70s showing the idea that while we can restart the heart, that there, then the second step of the actual resuscitation arises. And this is what we're focusing on, this post-resuscitation disease. And why do we know that this post-resuscitation disease is so important? So if we take all comers who have CPR, we have the initial uh, people who do not survive the cardiopulmonary arrest, and that can happen at about, let's say that's about 60% of people. We actually see more people die in this post-ischemic time. So the second uh, hit phenomenon, and this is where we see about 70 75% of people drop off. So how do we focus this? We've heard a lot about targeting uh, temperature control, so that's things in the brain to slow metabolism, control seizures, uh, Lyle uh, adequate oxygen delivery. Uh, and blood to the brain. We've also talked about ways to restart the heart, so this would be ideas to increase cardiac output or keep cardiac output sufficient in order for the brain to see the oxygenation. And then how do we target this inflammation process and what mechanisms are good for that? So um, this is out of uh, the guidelines, and I think uh, this has been hit a lot, but what uh, we'd like to avoid doing is to uh, be able to prognosticate really, really early. We don't know how people are going to do early, and I think we should all at least wait until 72 hours in order to start to get any sort of prognostication. So what can we do in order to help uh, with the neuroprotection? So this is a very busy slide, and I don't want to get too bogged down into the details, but I think that there are four uh, mechanisms that you should look at, and these are uh, what's in the boxes, so the NMDA activation, the oxidation injury, the inflammation, the mitochondrial damage, and these are all pillars that we can work towards with medication in order to try to best uh, protect uh, neuro neurons after uh, cardiac arrest. So this is a drug looking at uh, magnesium, and uh, magnesium works on the NMDA receptor, and this is given in the uh, post-arrest Cycle. And what they saw was, while there was no impact on survival, that patients who received a uh, reasonably high dose of magnesium actually had improved uh, neurologic status if they did survive. And so but what that says is there must be a, site, a neuroprotection mechanism for it. And people were able to have meaningful outcomes, meaning that they were able to live independently as opposed to live in a facility, which if you're someone who has survived a cardiac arrest would be very meaningful. Uh, there's also uh, looks at coenzyme Q10, which is a works on the mitochondrial of transport chain, and that showed a survival benefit at three months. There are studies looking at inhaled xenon gas, and while this study wasn't powered to actually show a mortality benefit, what it did show was that on MRI there was improved in white matter changes. So by giving uh, inhaled xenon, which works by the NMDA receptors as well, that this would uh, preserve brain, uh, brain uh, tissue. And this is a study looking at vasopressin steroids and epinephrine in uh, cardiac arrest. And basically what it showed was that the use of vasopressin and steroids in conjunction with epinephrine uh, showed a favorable neuroprotection. And the idea behind this is twofold. Uh, one, that steroids decrease inflammation from an inflammatory pathway, and two, that vasopressin uh, uh, can be dilate to the brain and thus you can have improved uh, oxygenation to the brain. So where do the challenges lie and why have we not found the answer yet? I think a lot of people have talked about how heterogeneous the population who uh, progressive cardiac arrest is. So not all comers are equal, and I can't tell you who will survive a cardiac arrest and who won't. Um, and thus, the pre predisposing conditions, or the pre-morbid conditions, have a lot to do with how the patient will, uh, 
will recover afterwards. Additionally, the mechanism of injury from cardiac arrest can be very different. So someone who we've heard about people who die from trauma, people who die from cardiac arrest, the mechanism of injury, while ultimately resulting in hypoxia to the brain, uh, has reversible states or uh, underlying uh, inflammatory states that go along with it that could also impact these. And so actually being able to tease out a patient population in order to study this has proven to be very difficult. So this is the whole team at NYU that uh, focuses on cardiopulmonary arrest. It is not a short list, definitely. Um, and uh, just showing that all of our work is being done all over the country, and I thank everyone for their time. Thank you so much, uh, to Shari, uh, to illustrate the fact that there are actually, I, I know that Lance and, and Sam Tishman talked about, you know, and, um, uh, Stefano talked about you know, cocktails and trying to put things together, but there are actually drugs that are available that have been looked at in cardiac arrest settings that might even be beneficial today. That we can look at again, so thank you so much. Um, we are going over, we were going to have questions and answers now. Um, what I might do is just ask if you'll allow me to just talk about a couple of studies that we're uh, developing at NYU. And this is really me um, and my conscience. Um, so because a lot of people ask me, you know, what's the status, what's the update with our research. I'm sure everyone else here probably has the same experience. Everyone I'm sure wants to know how Sam Tishman's study is going. And it's like, guys, these things take a long time. I can't, it's not like I can tweet it for you every day, like, oh, this is what happened yesterday, this is what happened tomorrow. It, these things take forever. And a lot of these things, you know, what you're hearing today is people are on the cusp. We're pushing boundaries. And when you're doing that, there is no precedent. Right? There is no precedent for what Sam Tishman is doing. There is no precedent for what, for what uh, or what Stefano described in, in this uh, an NSS Times lab at Yale, and so that's the issue. But what I do want to do is because we're actually recording this, and it's going to be on our website, so anyone who wants, has questions to ask me for the next couple of years, I'm just going to say, please go to our website. Everything that I know and more has been described in this session today, and I'm going to just finish it off by referring to some of our uh, studies. But when I look back, and I mentioned you know, I started this more than 20 years ago, and um, I was in England at the time at the University of Southampton, and this came out in one of the local newspapers, which was supposed to show me today. I guess I'd aged, and so this is actually what I was supposed to look like today. Unfortunately, I did lose my hair, and uh, I can't do anything about that. But here it is, uh, you know, standing at the pearly gates of heaven saying, No, I don't want to come in, I'm just researching out of body experiences for Southampton General. Which, if you remember, I told you I was fascinated by what happens to these people, you know, what's happening to their consciousness, and, and, and are they able to figure out what's going on during their cardiac arrest. Things have moved on a lot, as witnessed by all the discussions we've had today. And going back to our work, and you know, my questions at that time that I thought I would address in a year, which clearly did not happen, um, what I learned is the importance of pursuing something. So I, you know, we pursued something, we started pulling and like a detective, and you start to find things become more and more interesting. A lot of what you think maybe doesn't work out, but if you don't pursue it, you will never make any discoveries. So where are we today, for those who want to know? I described the results of the first AWARE study that challenged a lot of things that we didn't expect to happen. So we have now launched uh, AWARE number two. Um, and this is, again, a multi-center study that we aim to be carried out in 25 centers. We have roughly 20 sites right now working with us. It was developed over multiple phases. Um, and it's continuing to progress as we speak. And I'm going to talk a bit about that. But the thing I also want to point out is that because of this work, it led me to questions such as, well, what's happening inside the brain if people have cardiac arrest? It was very clear to me that com this is completely neglected. No one lives into it. And we put together systems to measure oxygen levels, and there was a question that was asked earlier about that, because I was fascinated to understand what is happening to people's brains while we're doing CPR, while we're trying to get them back. And this has led to its own field of inquiry, looking at near infrared spectroscopy, and multiple publications that have come out of that. In addition, we recognize the importance to sort of get some idea of whether enough oxygen is getting in the brain, and is that causing the brain to even start working again? Maybe these experiences that people are having have something to do with better quality resuscitation to the brain. And thankfully, that has led to um, uh, another area of work where we're looking at monitoring EEG or brain activity during cardiac arrest. So just to show you where we are now, this is the setup. You know, when we go to cardiac arrests at NYU and other centers that work with us, we put two monitors on the brain. One measures oxygen, one measures electricity. We're trying to see what the activity is going on inside the brain. We have an iPad that we take, which has an image and gives sounds. And we have Bluetooth headphones connected that we will give timed 
sounds to people while they're being resuscitated, and we can go back then and see how those may have related to what was happening to their cardiac arrest, what was happening to their brain in real time. Um, and this I pointed out, it's just understanding that there's a drop in blood flow which causes changes to the brain, and it's important to monitor that. But how, is, how do these projects work? It's very challenging to study cardiac arrest. Here is what we are sort of showing in terms of our patients. This is not quite up to date, but it's reasonably up to date. It's a few months back. And you'll see that from our institutions that are working with us, we've started out with more than 4,500 cardiac arrests. But if you look here in terms of the overall number of people who are able to be recruited, and that's because there might not be staff available at nights and weekends to help us get the patients, we get to 465, okay? But of those, and of the total number of people we've been trying to study, you only have 44 people who survive. Okay, so that's less than 10% of in-hospital cardiac arrest who have more than five minutes of CPR. And the key thing here is just to illustrate how much more work we have to do to save people's lives. And also how difficult it then becomes to study. But nonetheless, we've incorporated, like I said, you know, EEG monitoring for the first time into cardiac arrest so we can see real time what's happening. And that's completely eye-opening. We've discovered that actually, there are different patterns of brain activity going on throughout CPR with different EEG activities. Some of them, as we would expect, the majority of the time, there is no brain electrical activity going on that we can measure. That's the MDA, which is a big part of that pie chart. But there are seizure-like sort of epilepsy-like activity also going on periods of time during cardiac arrest. And even maybe some patterns that might be not quite normal but closer to normal activity in the brain which clearly shows that there's a lot of work to be done. And I want to point out that we even observed this up to 60 minutes into CPR. So for people who think that once you've deprived the brain of oxygen, that the brain function is gone, it's important to show that you know, actually 60 minutes into it, you can still get some kind of electrical activity. And that even if you can't restart the heart, it doesn't mean the brain is actually gone, which is usually how people think. They think the brain is gone after 5, 10, 20 minutes. And the question was asked about our work with brain oxygen monitoring. It's really a sensor we put on, as I said, to measure how much oxygen is getting into the brain in real time. And we've been able to show, as you'll see from this figure here, that there seems to be a relationship with how much oxygen is getting in the brain, which also probably reflects how much oxygen is getting in the heart, and the ability to restart the heart and save people's lives. You'll see as you go along, the group that has no ROS, i.e. the heart never restarted, were unfortunately far more people, but their oxygen levels were also much lower than those who initially survived and those in the far right who survived and left the hospital uh, with an intact brain. This work is continuing. Uh, what else are we doing? Well, the challenge with cardiac arrest is that you know, it's difficult, it's random, you don't know when it's going to happen. It's hard to get them to survive, unfortunately, despite our best efforts. But yet, you know, the question of what happens to your consciousness can be explored in other settings. There's another uh, particular circumstance that we're trying to study called deep hypothermic circulatory arrest. This is a procedure done predominantly now by cardiothoracic surgeons where they essentially will cool the brain down, not quite to the level that Sam Fisherman does, but to about 17, 18 degrees Celsius, which is about 68, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And if they're trying to do surgery on the heart, they will stop the brain, and then they give themselves 30 minutes, 40 minutes sometimes to be able to go and, and fix the heart problem, uh, and then we warm the patient up and preserve the brain at that time. So we're trying to also develop pilot methods to see if we can measure consciousness like we're doing with the AWARE study, but in that particular model, which mimics cardiac arrest and death. Biologically, again, the heart is stopped. There's no uh, activity going on at that time, and we're trying to see what happens. When does consciousness disappear? When does it emerge out of that setting? And again, going back, I now realize that although I've spent the last maybe 15, 20 years trying to measure consciousness and what happens in the brain and understand all of that, but I'm now maybe because I'm getting older, maybe I'm getting closer to my own death, maybe because I realize I'm a man and I'm at the age where I'm likely to perhaps get a heart attack. Um, but I also realize it's important to I can study what people are saying. And so we've started a whole program where we're going back and trying to go through thousands of cases of people who've already survived to better understand what the experience was like. What we've come to realize is that what has been described so far as a so-called near-death experience is very inaccurate. It's just the tip of an iceberg. It has not been studied adequately. The research scales that are used are not appropriate and not precise enough, and it leads to a lot of controversy. So I'm going to talk a bit about that. Talking about the little child whose case I saw and other children who have had near-death experiences, there have been no systematic studies of children 
but they go to the intensive care unit, they go on ECMO, and they survive, and they seem to be reporting these. There are case reports, but no one's on a systematic study. So we're starting a new study that's looking at children who survive the intensive care unit to see what they've experienced and what it's like for them, and how does that relate to um, the adults. And in addition to that, um, we're looking at, again, like I said, this transformative change. Why do people become better? Why do they have more purpose and meaning? What are the things that change in them long term after the cardiac arrest? And finally, can we study the modulators of all of this in the brain using imaging? So these are things that we're trying to do. I want to just ask you if I know it's late and probably everyone's quite tired, but just five minutes just to illustrate some of the challenges with understanding the experience of death. Okay. What happens when someone's had a cardiac arrest? Well, let's, let's really think about it. Someone's heart stops, they go into, as you heard, into an instantaneous coma. We try to revive them. If we're lucky, someone like Cherie will restart the heart and you get them back. They never come out of that coma. Their brain, as was shown in the previous slide and talks, becomes inflamed and swollen. Okay? It really becomes it goes on fire. And so you expect the memory circuits to shut down. What then happens is to keep them in the intensive unit, we give them drugs that sedate people which also affect your memory circuits. And this can go on for days or weeks. And eventually the person comes out, and then we meet them and say, oh, tell me, for example, Shuri, what was your experience like? What would it, and then they're like, oh, I don't remember anything. And people say, oh, there's nothing that happens. But of course you're going to lose memory. But what would you expect? Or they come back and they describe all different kinds of things. Right? So their memories um, are either lost or fragmented, or multiple memories might collapse into one. For example, maybe three weeks into their ICU stay, the nurse was trying to prevent them from grabbing their breathing tube, and then they imagined that they were attacked by some demons later. Right? So you have to be able to distinguish all of these different things when you're studying these experiences. You can't just take everything that people are saying and, and just assume that it will happen at the same time. It's going to happen anyway. And then, of course, people interpret things. We all do based upon their own personal views, their biases, their opinions. And so you'll hear people describing the same thing in multiple different ways. For example, if they see a light, they might say, oh, that light was, you know, I saw a being that was full of kind of kindness and compassion. Somebody else may say, I saw God. Somebody else may say, I saw Jesus. Somebody else says, I'm an atheist. I have no idea why I saw this, but I did see it, and this person was really kind and generous with me. So, but they're all describing this light. They're describing a being that they, they felt was full of kindness and compassion. And of course, the media takes up on this and adds a lot of stuff because they're trying to make things fit with old models. And one of the key things we're understanding here is that I don't think we should be looking at the past. We shouldn't try to make sure that these things fit in with what we may have been taught, whether from philosophy or theology, but also what is the future like. So just to illustrate to you what are the key things that we're understanding, we're going through with one of our research associates um, a database of people who've had cardiac arrest and or critical illness and survived and their experiences. I also have, as I said, almost 500 cases that I collected more than 20 years ago, and there are other resources. But what are we seeing emerge is that when people go through this, they describe the following features. They have a perception of leaving their body, and we hear more, we'll hear more about that in the panel discussion uh, from Dr. Tom Afterheiden, who had a patient that he took care of. They then, for some reason, have this life review, which is very meaningful to them. They go back and they review everything they've done. Then they seem to feel like they're being pulled to some sort of destination, and then there's a decision made. Usually they say they don't want to come back, but they realize, for example, if you're a young mother, that you, know, you have a two-year-old who's going to take care of my child. And with that thinking, they find themselves back in pain, back in their body. And that's what they do. Now, just to illustrate, I said, you know, the so-called near-death experience, the you know, tunnel light, the light flashing by you, is a really, really oversimplified way of looking at what we really describe. We've started looking at almost 42, 43 cases already. And in doing that more systematically, we've already found um, almost 40 or 50 separate themes. This is a qualitative study that we're doing in what people describe. I'm clearly not going to go through all of this, but just to say that there are multiple other themes along the lines of those broad categories uh, that reflect essentially an educational experience that people seem to have when they've gone through this. And we've just put them into a table for you, as I said, you know, this perception of separating, this perception of a journey, this perception of having had an educational experience, this perception of arriving at some sort of destination they often call home, and then this return that they have. So the question, of course, is, you know, we will never know what somebody's inner experience is like. It's impossible to either accept it or refute it. But the fact is that it occurs, um, and it's important for us to realize that our patients do have them. And they often feel afraid to talk about it because of being ridiculed. 
Um, so there are different themes that they describe. Um, I have them here, but I don't want to go over too much of time right now. But just to say that for those who want to have a look at it, these are actually quotes from patients and what they've said. And we have many, many, many of these that I'm not obviously showing you, but just it's like a sort of a, a gist of what, uh, what we describe. You know, this is the person, your perception of separating the body. I turned around instinctively, instinctively and to my great surprise, I saw my body still lying on the bed with the eyes shut. I then understood that I was outside my body. This recall of information regarding what's happening to them. I could see and hear everything, but could not feel what they were doing to the body below. While watching the doctors and nurses working on the body below, I also remember being able to watch what was happening at the same time in the room they had taken my mom. In terms of life review, I began a review of my life moments of my life. We talked about that previously. And then, you know, people seem to feel that everything feels more realistic to them uh, compared to everything else that they've done. They also sort of see sometimes the consequences of their actions. If they hurt people, they then see the downstream effects of the actions that they may have done. So again, um, I'll end with this slide. Shai was kind enough to show uh, our collaborators just to say that this is a huge effort among other institutions around the world. Clearly, we can't do this alone. Um, and I'm very grateful for everybody who's helped us. I'm grateful to all of the speakers today, and I'm grateful to all of you for being here to listen about what's happening in the field of cardiac arrest and resuscitation and explain what happens with that. Uh, the final thing I'll just say before I, I do really end, well, this is our team at NYU. We have new members whose pictures are not here, but we're sitting in the back. Um, anyone who's interested in more information, like I said, and this is really for the camera, for future reference, Everything will be on our website. Please send anyone you want. Unfortunately, I'm not very good at social media. I don't have time for it either. And research doesn't happen in a day. So be patient, but information will be posted as soon as we have it, and I showed you some of our information. So thank you so much for everyone's time. I think we may have just maybe a few minutes, maybe five minutes, just for questions. Um, um, before we end. if you can just come to the front for a couple of questions and answers. <laughs> Where are we here? Anyway, uh, I have a question for Stefano. Um, yeah, it, it's very, but it's very basic. Um, I was kind of disappointed when, I mean, I'm thrilled by the research, obviously, but you brought this tissue back to life there, doing the right things in terms of energy metabolism, ionic gradients, but then you said you put the ECOG strips on, and, and what you did not detect was any uh, sign, even a meager sign of electrical activity. But I think I remember reading that uh, literally there was some concern that if you reanimated these pig brains, you might actually restore consciousness, which might be possibly an awful experience for these disembodied pig brains. So in fact, you, you, sed you gave sedation to put the brains to sleep as part of your cocktail, in which case that would explain why your ECOGs were flat. Can you comment on that? Sure. Uh, so as the ECOG data uh, evidences, we, by current clinical definitions, we can't technically say that this is a, a living organ. Uh, this is a cellularly active brain. And you're correct in uh, that there are neuronal activity block blockers within the actual perfusate. And so we included uh, a particular blocker to, to quell the excitotoxicity that's associated uh, with anoxic injury. 
And so this could be one possible explanation as to why we see electrochemically viable cells uh, on uh, during the whole cell patch clamp analyses when we prepare acute slices because when we're preparing uh, the slices for EFIS, uh, we wash out the perfusate. Whereas when we're actively recording the ECOG during perfusion, then the brain is continuously being exposed to what's in our uh, blood analog, our, our cocktail with all of the different types of components and blockers. Uh, so, what kind of sedative did you use? It was uh, uh, lamotrigidine. Okay. And I got one, if, if you don't, if you'll humor me. Sure. At the end of the day, why did you do the study? Well, uh, the first reason is because we were struck by um, the profound ability to be able to preserve cellular uh, viability within the slice cultures uh, that I mentioned in the talk earlier. And then, uh, and then really, how could we recapitulate this in the whole brain in order to better study what happens in a large mammalian brain following anoxic injury? and to not only study neuroprotection and new avenues in order to protect brain cells following this type of injury, but also to create a, a new model that we can test new things in order to be able to bridge the gap between basic science research and clinical medicine. Thanks. I'd like to address some of the issues about consciousness. I'm an anesthesiologist, so I make people unconscious for a living. Okay. Um, about five years ago, I was at an anesthesiology meeting, and there's a group at one of the Harvard hospitals that's, they, they do seizure surgery, uh, they do anesthesia for patients with seizure surgery, so the patients already have a bunch of pre-existing electrodes placed in the brain. And what they found was that when they anesthetize the patient, it's been well studied in anesthesiology at what uh, point patients go unconscious, even though we don't quite understand the nature of unconsciousness. But they found that there were two segments of the brain that they went from being out of phase 180 degrees to going in phase 180 degrees when they were uh, in phase, rather when they were unconscious. And I looked at it and said to myself, like, well, one of the purposes of brain waves, and just to agree, it's like the platypus is the most primitive mammal. And it has a rather large brain, but it doesn't have brain waves, and it's not terribly intelligent. When you look at electronics communication network, like a phone network, um, they have different packets of information, and there's like signals as to, uh, you know, this one goes to that number, this one goes to that number. And it allows, um, let's see how to put it, a condensation of the transmission lines. And I think the same thing is happening in the brain, that the brain waves serve as signals for different parts of the brain to communicate with each other. And what I saw there, when the uh, two waves were in, uh, they were in sync with each other, when they were in phase with each other, if you look at the difference between the waves, it's zero. And you can't communicate information across the ways when they're out of phase one is zero the others at one it allows you by subtraction to communicate information and that's what i think is going on with consciousness in anesthesia but it's also some of these other things as patients recover they may not have the appropriate brain waves for parts of the brain to communicate over time through learning or other experiences that may get reestablished that's kind of what kind of see from some of this. Some of this it's just such an emerging field. I mean, this stuff. I mean, what I'm glad of is that we're actually talking about consciousness as part of this. We don't forget as even being there and we have to recover. Yeah, I mean, synchronized brain activity of large networks is needed uh, to, to possibly or for consciousness to recover. So that's, that's definitely the part of it. But I guess the question is, you know, the, the clinical practice and how we look at the patient and the measurements, what is that telling us? You know, patient is not waking up, EEG is very slow. What, what is that telling us about the cells, about the functions? Like, is there a chance? What is the point of no return? Sort of the question. And there is no chance for, this, for the system to come back and large scale networks to come back and, and be active again, allowing recovery of consciousness. Maybe just the last question then. 
Hi, uh, I had this question for uh, Sam Farnia. Um, I'm a PhD student in neuroscience at Walt Cornell. Um, you talked about this briefly with uh, with pharmacology, but uh, in my literature research, I saw that some characteristics of near-death experiences, like for example, a sense of time being altered, or like this noetic co quality, like I understood the ultimate truth, or out-of-body experiences, or divine connection to. Um, you know, like an unconditional love, or just a sense of like this is hyper real. So I saw like these uh, these examples of these characteristics can be seen in other things, such as um, temporal lobe epilepsies, or even in a deep states of meditation and prayer. Or sometimes they happen. I saw some cases where they happen spontaneously. So I just wanted to know like your thoughts on that. I think so. The, obviously, this is a deeper question to answer. But just to illustrate for you that what we're saying is essentially. Conscious experience um, can, different experiences you can have can occur under different circumstances and there's overlaps. So just to give a classic example, the so-called outer body experience, the perception of seeing yourself in the body, is actually described by 10% of the population. We uh, had a survey carried out in 2001 when I started this across the whole of the UK. Um, and 10% of people report it and we know that it occurs when you, not just when you're near death, but let's say if you're very relaxed, if you go up to a mountain, doing meditation, there are other things that can trigger this perception of you separating from yourself. Interestingly, uh, the same people who did it for us in 2001 did it again a couple of months ago, and it's still 10% of the population who reported. Um, so just by having some overlap, like for example, what does the near death, if you break each individual part of it, someone says, I feel love, I feel peaceful, but you can feel love and peace when you go up to a mountain, let's say, especially in New York City. So the challenge is when, when you're looking things up online, if, if there is no absolute definition of what an out-of-body experience is, if there's no definition of what a near-death experience is, people then find overlaps and claim it to be the same thing. Um, I can certainly you know, meet with you separately and show you all of the data that we have. My point simply is that without accurate, accurate research scales, it's very easy to call different things that have some similarities being the same. Like we wouldn't call all fruits, apples and oranges, apples and pairs were different, but if you just want to write pet fruit, then you might just categorize them all into the same. So that, that's the key thing I want to say. The final point is that it may be that one day we can find the brain intermediary that induces these experiences. So I'm sure there's a pathway that causes people to have an out-of-body experience when you come close to death or under other circumstances. But again, identifying the neural transmitter doesn't mean the experience is real or not real. That, that's really what I've been trying to say in this. Thank you.